No, it's fine. It makes me feel like I'm on Lost. Oh, yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That was so obnoxious. Welcome. Welcome to... <laughs> Jesus Christ! Welcome to the to the Lost After. Hey yo, the Lost After. We're doing. We're t- it's, this is Brady, and I'm here with Chuck Bars, and we uh, we. And this starting- is a blog about coping with life after the finale of Lost. I was a huge Lost fan. I know you were. You were. A big I was Lost obsessed fan. with it. You know what? Actually, that was my introduction to podcast because I wrote into <laughs> that podcast, and they answered two of my questions in a row. And by they, I mean the executive producers, Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse, and they they go, hey, we got a question here from Brady Harden, and they answered it. Then they go, oh, we've got another question from Brady Harden, and Carlton Hughes goes, way to go, Brady Harden. <laughs> and that's when you knew. That's when I knew. Oh, I like I podcasts know. because I heard my name. <laughs> I want to hear that over and over and over. I want to keep on hearing my name on a podcast. What if I go on there and say it and make other people say it, You're too? You're the big fish in a small pond, Brady. <sighs> so speaking of uh, television shows from the early aughts. <laughs> Yes, <laughs> pretty. You were uh, you were in a, a a TV show. Yes, 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 um, yes. You may have you may have heard of it. <laughs> if you were if you have insomnia and the T the, the and TBN channel for for youth called JCTV TBN that's a two forty seven dash seven. If you have Direct TV, I'm just kidding. I don't, I don't know. Backslash <laughs> skull sign plus sign. <laughs> exclamation point yeah 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 you have to put all that in um tongue emoji (laughs) uh so i've i've had the privilege of seeing probably i mean like the tolerable amount of this show which is about an episode and a half (laughs) that's generous (laughs) depending on what season you're in well okay well but there are some pretty golden uh, moments in there so yeah in my early early late teens early 20s yeah so in the season one of this show it was produced by a group of homeschoolers writing about a public high school red flags red flags and um (laughs) i was kind of like in my church i was kind of known as being the dramatic guy like i was in like production of stuff and so they repped me in and they're like hey do you want to be part of this like yeah sure so um it ended up becoming kind of like a thing and so we made a f- we made a first season we ended up finding a little bit of distribution we were on like um internationally okay, so, you, so you started we started with just like let's make a show and see what happens and then it got picked up by tbn Kind of. So I was in season one and I was, I was just an actor. And so think of like a bad, like, um, have you seen that meme where it's like a little kid outlining their cat and the cat looks really worried and it's supposed to be like the cat's music. And then the outline is Christian music. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> right? yeah, yeah. So that's kind of what it was, but with To Boy Meets World. So uh-huh. my character was like the older brother, Eric, but a Christian who was going to end up being a youth pastor by season two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That, you know, that uh, follows. <laughs> so it was a lot of homeschoolers trying to write about high school i kind of like elbowed in a little bit and then i ended up be, like wrote most of the second season so, okay so wait it was a school it was a show about public school starring homeschoolers uh-huh. right and written by homeschoolers i was a public you were the though. you were the public school consultant for the show Kind of, well, yeah. So you could say like, "No, guys, here's that's what would happen." Not how it is. This is so unprofessional. <laughs> we would go on the set, and we would actually fly in some people from LA, right? Like we were going to be professional. Whoa! Actors. And um, all right. Uh, I'm trying to think if any of them made a like would be recognizable. Let me let me get back to that. But uh, they what we would do though is like we didn't like the scripts, and so we kind of just improvised a lot of the first season. Then I tried to write more of the second season, and then I had also like directed it, and then was also played my character. And then I got paid like around it was like sixty dollars or sixty hours a week, and I probably got paid around two hundred and fifty dollars a week. It was sixty hours. Wow! <laughs> but I did it for the Lord. <laughs> Because I wanted to tell people about the You were storing up treasure in heaven. In heaven, you were getting paid. 
uh, fifteen hundred dollars a week. That economy net does not work. In heaven, you are getting paid. It's like we're trying to discourage you from being selfish, but really, you're just encouraging me to be selfish later. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 When it's allowed. Yeah, like if it's I have a bigger house than you, you know I'm going to be proud of that shit. Yeah, I'm going to show it off. Bitch. <laughs> I love, yeah, I mean, that, yeah, that's like a, almost like a good place in type of, uh, type of objection there. Chuck, were you ever on TV? Well, today we've got a wonderful <laughs> guest. Um, I want to introduce you all. Uh, here's how I was introduced to Alice. Speaking um, of TV. Yeah, speaking of TV, um, Alice was is making a really amazing website and resource called Dare to Doubt, and I came across it on my own, and I was like, this is a really cool resource, and I emailed, and I was like, hey, I would like to see if we could be, be put on this, and she was like, hey, I like you guys, and I'm just learning about Jamie Lee Finch, and I was like, this is awesome, and then I started emailing back and forth, and she was like, yeah, I know about you guys, and I'm learning about Jamie Lee Finch, and I'm like, that's really awesome, that's really cool. Cool. By the way, I was thinking earlier of who may be famous that people may know about. And after that TV show, Completing Caden, I was in this movie called Logan that starred Boo Boo Stewart, who ended up being in Boo Boo. Oh, I'm a big Boo Boo fan. He ended up in um, <laughs> Boo Boo Fett from uh, from Star Wars. One of the Twilight movies, a X Men movie. And then the other Boop. one was Leo Howard, who I had a scene with. It was a really interesting kid. And he ended up playing young Conan, had a show on Disney Channel. All right. And is doing other action movies. I don't know anything. All right. Uh, I played his English teacher. So what you're saying is you weren't as good as him and you're not famous. So uh, Alice was learning about Jamie Lee Finch and we're like, oh my gosh, that's awesome. We love her. <laughs> so, uh, and then it was after that that I realized that she's been on television i thought that was really cool and then i read her story and i'm like that's one that we want to share so Very tight. um here yeah she alice, is. yeah uh yeah alice has tv tv wise just throwing that out there uh, are you young, IMDb young and the restless her? i already did jesus go ahead you sent me the link i know but i didn't know you were going to introduce her this way but go ahead oh i mean you already introduced do the... accents for each one of these uh th th what uh <laughs> The, the lion game the, the the young and the restless that was a little racist dukes of hazard was the young the right the russian was racist oh, maybe a little bit alice thank you so much for joining the show this is embarrassing but i'm loving it it's not oh thank you for having me i am so happy <laughs> and grateful to be here <laughs> very cool good i'm glad the gratefulness is not worn off yet <laughs> No, not yet. <laughs> That's how we get you. <laughs> um, Alice, before we kick off, can you tell us um, a, a uh, f funny or frustrating story about being on set somewhere? Oh, I'm putting goodness. you on the spot. Um... I'm, I'm, hardcore. <laughs> I'm Chuck. Yeah. Can you give me a blooper? <laughs> what is she, a DVD menu? <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing fresh in my mind, coming on the heels of listening to your story about homeschoolers writing a TV show about public school, yeah. mm. I was homeschooled my whole life, oh, yeah. and for over Ooh. a decade, I played a public high school going character in pretty much everything, <sighs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, which was super awkward and weird to have to like... People would be reminiscing and hair and makeup about their prom, you know, or what it's like to run for prom. And I'm thinking, like, I never even went to prom. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Wanted to. Me and a friend tried to coerce these two guys in our youth group to take us to their prom. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I did. I went <laughs> I went with girls from my youth group to prom. But we weren't really dating. But as friends. <laughs> yes, definitely as friends. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I, I nothing is, like, super popping out to me in terms of... Uh, Dude, I, t I totally nope, get I that. Sorry, go ahead. I didn't <laughs> no, no, no. You go ahead. I was drawing a blank. So <laughs> I'll let you know if one comes to me, though. Oh, definitely. Okay. I was just going to say I, I relate to that real hard. Like, that. There, like so much of my adolescence was me having, like, a like a awkward feeling in the pit of my stomach when anybody was talking about normal teenage life. Because I was homeschooled, too. And just, like, <laughs> not knowing, like, really hoping that nobody, like, draws attention to me in that moment. You know what I mean? You're like, please yeah. don't. Yes. I don't, no, I, <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what homeroom yeah. is. I don't even, I know. 
<laughs> yeah, homeroom. Like I was trying, and I remember even just the class English confused me. I'm like, but you already speak English. I don't understand why it's called English. Like just dumb things like that. <laughs> mm, yeah, but for sure. Kind of a one of a funny home stumped homeschooler moment. Not related to my acting career, but. How 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 fresh language wise can we get here? Pretty fresh. Oh, so I <laughs> say fresh um, all the time. So, as fresh okay, as it gets. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I was on a mission trip to India uh-huh. when I was a teenager, and we were staying at the New Delhi YMCA hostel. Okay. And the pool had a sign over it that said K U M Pool. And all the kids start snickering. And these are the uh-huh. kids that go to school. And I'm like, come fool. What's so funny about this? I mean, this? that's pretty fucking funny. And I'm, I'm like, not getting the joke. I'm yeah. like, what? What is it? Yeah. And I'm like, I, I decide to risk showing my homeschooled colors. And I'm mm. like, guys, what's what's so funny? And yeah. they're like, come fool. And I'm like, come fool. I, I don't get it. <laughs> like, just like a deer in the headlights. And then they had to explain to me about ejaculate being called cum. And it was oh, man. so embarrassing, but funny. But I just mostly just felt like an idiot. Right. Just like, and, <laughs> yep. and like, I love that. <laughs> my version. Not is to mention that... like the, my homeschooled version of sex ed was like more than lacking. So I'm, I'm glad that you're even able to swing with their explanation of it because you just never know when you're homeschooled. What was your homeschool sex ed? Oh man. Uh, my homeschool sex ed was my, was my mom like very awkwardly giving me a book that (laughs) was, I was in like, I think I was in like sixth grade. I was probably like 12 and it was like a very, it was like a cartoony book. Like it was kind of (laughs) cartoony. And I'm the feeling like nerves part, just listening to there you. was no the yeah, right I'm saying dude there was no like actual like okay so there was and anat- there's anatomy drawn like accurate anatomy drawn in a lot of the pages but when they actually described sex they used machines like a male machine and a female machine and the male machine oh had gosh. like a long pointy rod and it went into the female machine and then there was like some ejaculate and i was like oh that's what's happening when i'm doing this thing that i've mm. been doing since i was like 10 where do i get one of these is this what <laughs> amazon is about <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But I still didn't understand the concept of masturbation God, at that's that point, hot. even though I was like doing it. Uh, yeah, you know. So I was like incredibly useless. <laughs> Dude, but- say my like my homeschool sex ed. My mom gave me a book when I was twelve by Dr. James Dobson Ew, of Focus uh, on the Family. Yeah, yeah. Right? Like, I eventually and, um, got a James Dobson book too. Oh, okay. Mine didn't have cartoons, though. Mine was just called Preparing for Adolescence, and it looked straight out of the late 70s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Um, like, fucks up the family. Oui. Yeah, <laughs> Like right. a new new name for, new meaning for the acronym. But yeah, like, I remember when you got to the part about masturbation, which I realized I'd also been doing since uh-huh. I was about five, but not reaching the climax that right. he said you could apparently reach. And but he wrote <laughs> he wrote it he wrote about it very ambiguously. He was like, unlike a lot of Christians, I don't think masturbation's uh, inherently like, wrong. This is inherently wrong. I think wrong. I read There's the same book. Struggle yeah. with guilt if you do it, but you know, lustful thoughts. And right. how do you masturbate without having lustful thoughts mm-hmm. once you are aware that this is what you're doing? And it's, uh, I remember it just putting me in this mental bind of like, well, he says I can do it. The Bible does is not specific about it, but yet I feel horribly guilty because lustful thoughts. Right. And so it was just a total mind fuck. <laughs> well, what comes well, first, the jerking or the egg? Right. Because that's the masturbation tool is called the egg. Um, another thing, my my version of your story <laughs> earlier <laughs> was when I was younger, they would make fun of my first name. Ha ha, Brady Harden or Brady Bunch, Brady right. Bunch. Brady oh, Bunch. No. And then Did I got they call you Brady Hard On? They called me Hard On, and when I was in junior high, I didn't know what that was. Yeah, Brady Hard On. And, and girls, you were like, yeah, that's me, Brady Hard On. <laughs> Because it sounded like a, like I should have a That's leather jacket, <laughs> like I should have a leather jacket and fireworks behind me. Um, no, I had to have that explained. We need to go to break because this is a lot of information that we're sharing before the first commercial. <laughs> I mean, guys. we start talking about once you open the masturbation. Uh, yeah, the three of us are going to be gonna, problematic. This yeah, episode. this is going to be a problem. This, this three o, <laughs> the synergy is more like S I N, or G synergy. S-I-O, with like, okay, yeah, synergy. not like office synergy, but like, 
Oh, that was good. Sinful synergy. We'll be uh, right when back. When we get back, more uh, homonyms from Brady. After these messages, we'll be right back. Oh, boy. Oh, hello there, Chuck. <laughs> I didn't see you there. How are you? Hmm? Good. Just uh, editing the episode. What's up? <laughs> What's up? Oh, you commoner and your common talk. I guess I'm what you would say, <laughs> doing not much. <laughs> what is this? Chuck, pst. Chuck, it's me, your pal Brady. I'm practicing patronizing, so I'm working on being more condescending to people. <laughs> oh, Ooh. do you have any idea where Matt can get some crumpets around here? <laughs> uh, wh- why are you doing this? You know, for our Patreon, we've been asking people to patronize our page, and I didn't <laughs> want to ask them to do something I wasn't willing to do it myself, so I figured I'd get some practice. In. Oh, God. Brady, no, that's, huh? that's what? not what it means. Oh, no? Listen. Listeners can go to our Patreon page, pick the level you want to contribute. Oh. Each level has special rewards. Okay. Like exclusive life after minisodes. Or not safe for work bloopers? Uh, or like a monthly collection of deconstruction memes. And even personal consultations or meet up with your favorite host, Chuck and Brady? Yeah. Brady. Patreon.com slash the life after. <laughs> I guess even you could find it. <laughs> After those messages, we are back. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I, I hope made that's a not mistake. A yeah, no, it's not asking you to do this intro. Yeah, sorry. You make a lot of mistakes by asking me to do things. Alice, we want to thank you so much for being on our show. Yeah, we're excited. Um, <laughs> can thank you, you. kind of give us a little bit of an intro? How how did you get started in your life and with walking with the Lord? Oof. <laughs> <laughs> Oof. Uh, right. <laughs> I know I still feel like I have like a little bit of like a uh, reaction, mm. like right there in my gut, yeah. in my yeah. diaphragm. Um, no, 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 it's fine. I've learned to be very amused by triggers by now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, now yeah. I just look at them like, oh, yeah, ugh, squishies. <laughs> I just started about <laughs> righteous gemstones. And I've been having so many oh. of those moments where I literally shudder on the couch. Just oh, like, yeah, no, I know. Like I, I just started flinch. that the other day. Yeah. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. Okay. Anyway. What other shows have done that for you before you start? Now I'm really curious. Ooh, um, other shows have done it. So The Sinner, kind of heavy and uh-huh. dark, did yeah. for me a little bit. This with Jessica bit. Biel, right? Yeah, the one yeah, with Jessica okay. Biel. I was like like uh, two episodes in, and I I told my sister, I'm like, okay, spoiler alert, is this just about religious trauma syndrome? I think it's the first show about religious trauma syndrome. Yeah, 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 they for sure. call it that, but I, I've seen it. <laughs> right. But uh, other shows that give me that reaction, I don't know about shows, but movies, like I remember Saved, Always, oh, yeah, and I love sure. that movie. I still love that movie just because it's such an ode to my teen years, yeah. um, ode to youth group days. Even uh, as a teenage Christian, I was like, oh yeah, this is really accurate. You know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, really accurate. Um, no, that gives me that sort of like visceral reaction. Or if I'm in the Uber and someone's playing a Christian song, oh, oh yeah, god, yeah, do. that I could be like, oh, oh. it feels so inappropriate every <laughs> time I hear. Stop! Every it time I hear a song wow. like that, it, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> I know they're thinking they're having a driving ministry on wheels. Like they have me trapped and they're thinking maybe I'm going to ask, what is this beautiful song that's making me feel uplifted? (laughs) And they're going to be able to say, I'm so glad you asked. That's the love of the Lord shining through me to you right now through my music choice because that's what I would have done. (laughs) Excuse me, ma'am. When you drive, there's just a hope that I don't understand. Honestly, I'm just just back there like, I feel (laughs) angels around this car. I'm just back there like, uh, oh yeah, the guitarist from this band slept with my friend outside of, outside of his Mm -hmm. marriage. Like, which is true (laughs) about certain. What band? Tell me off air. Can you, or can you tell me? Yeah, I'll tell you off air. Okay, but I I got stuck in one of those conversations once with my Uber driver, and I was trying to be really patient. But it was one of those things where like I had to be honest about who I was and my background, and it turned into like a a really like quick hot take. Oh, well, you can't let the things that man does to shadow your way, you know, shadow your way of the Lord. Like that sort of thing was trying to be, and it was like you said, I felt trapped. It's like, oh my God, why is this coming up right now? Anyway, enough yeah. about me. I want to hear your story, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, my story, the the origin story. I've been trying to get better at con- at condensing it into it's smaller it? sound bite, mm. podcast friendly nutshells. It is hard. Um, I was 
I my walk with the Lord probably began in utero. Um, right. I was just I always feel like I was just born a Christian, yeah. which really bothered me when I was a little kid because I always wanted to have a, a fancy testimony to yeah, share, absolutely. and mine was so boring when it came to time for sharing because I'm like I was just born this way. Um, and my dad, when when I was a toddler, my parents felt like God was calling them to be missionaries um, in Asia. So they took me and my little brother, it was just the two of us at the time, um, overseas to Nepal and Thailand through the Foursquare Church. And wow. they uh, that was when my parents belonged to the Foursquare denomination, which, um, if you don't know, kind of sprang out of the Pentecostal family. Right. It's like a really um, wild, charismatic sort yeah. of thing, right? Yeah. And where are we the, right now? So toddlerhood. Um, so is that what you mean? No, what location? Like, where did you? Bay Area is where I was born Bay by Area. San Francisco. Okay, okay. That's where my parents met. That's where uh, they went to the Foursquare Church that then um, sent us overseas to Asia. We mm -hmm. were only there for nine months. And mm -hmm. then God closed the doors to that, mm -hmm. opened the door for my dad to be a pastor in Rockford, Illinois. And that's where I feel like I spent most of my childhood. Okay. Um, and my dad didn't remain a pastor with the Foursquare Church for long. Uh, we started going to a non-denominational fellowship, not a church. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, yeah. Was, <laughs> they're very emphatic about that. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. We are a fellowship, and we have common meals, not potlucks. Oh, um, okay, yeah. And so, it, but a, a convenient yeah, rebranding of the same same old shit, yeah. right? Yeah. My yeah, and, like they would say they were non-denominational, but um, vineyard or charismatic would be the okay. denomination. Right. Okay, so let me stop you there for a second. So your parents like got swept up in the Toronto thing, right? Like, and and I guess like a lot of yeah. our listeners probably don't know what I mean when I say the Toronto. I thing. I don't even know. Honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so there was this like <clears throat> wild. What I mean, a Christian would refer to it as a revival. <gasps> Is this for the laughing? Toronto. Yeah, the spiritual yeah, the yeah, holy laughter. Sure. Yeah. <gasps> yeah, it's coming back to me now. Keep yeah, going. Yeah. Keep there going. was like, uh, um, I can't. Uh, fuck, I can't name names off the top of my head. Even uh, shamana, people shamana, 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 shamana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it wasn't like a, Haggy. No, 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 no. It wasn't those guys. It was. I can name some names. Yeah. Oh, yes, please. <laughs> Randy Clark, yes, John and Carol you. are not. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. Wes Campbell, David Ruiz. Like, yeah. there's a bunch of people who and, Heidi Baker, uh, a bunch of people who were involved then and and, like, and now. IHOP came out of that. The Ew. Vineyard Movement came out Ew. of that, and it was like this really. Yeah, I know, right? It was like this really big, like thousands of people were traveling to to Toronto to like be baptized in the Holy Spirit and experience these really wild, like charismatic, like, yeah, the spiritual laughter and the, you know, people be getting knocked over and like speaking in tongues really loudly and like, and that like spread all, literally all over the world and turned into a whole bunch of different movements. Uh, anyway, so your parents were like, got swept up in that, right? Which is like, not that weird for, for adults in the eighties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I think it was 94 when mm -hmm. the Toronto Blessing. So uh, I've, I've, there's lots of names for this revival movement mm -hmm. that, as you said, spread across the globe. Um, hundreds of thousands, millions of people were touched in some way by this movement. Um, I've come to call it the Toronto Blessing. When yeah. I was a kid, we called it the Renewal. Uh -huh. um, some yeah, yeah, Christ yeah, the Renewal, yeah. The renewal. Some called it the Father's blessing. I think I want to say people in the UK started calling it the Father's blessing. But basically, um, other Christians who were not in it, many of them call it uh, the counterfeit revival because it so closely mimicked um, what they might perceive as demonic activity. Because there was mm. maniacal laughter, like grown people in their Sunday best crawling and rolling on the floor and like cl clucking like chickens, barking like dogs, howling hysterically, pretending to give birth all the while the worship oh. music is going like it is it was fucking nuts. Like if you just YouTube Toronto Blessing, you will see because yeah. there's just no way that any description could yeah, accurately yeah, yeah. portray the sights and sounds that was that it was some people described it as like b a barnyard insane asylum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, which, but that's like which a is accurate. That's a great <laughs> like wouldn't put those things together, but it per makes perfect sense in that context. Yeah, yeah, like what with the animal sounds and then just the um, the delirium. Which as yeah. an adult, so I've done a lot of research on the Toronto Blessing 
now. Uh, and I had to, to kind of make peace with it because it, it was the one thing that still kind of held me back from mm-hmm. moving on and healing, I guess, from uh, after I'd left Christianity was because I was so haunted by what was that? You mm-hmm. know, what was I faked it. I'm right. sure other people faked it, like falling down to the floor and uh, we called it being slain. Yeah, um, being and slain in the spirit. Or you know, slain in the spirit. Yeah. Like, or like sh- I would like shake and tremble and like lurch. And or like drunk in dramatic. the spirit was a, was a thing that came out of that. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so as an adult, I had to, I had to re-examine it. And drunk in the spirit, this is, uh, it's very, that's a very accurate um, slogan, actually. Kind of like the get high on Jesus slogan because mm. it, uh, I got really into the field of neurotheology, which okay. is basically the neuroscience of mystical experiences and spirituality, Very cool. um, because it really helped me understand and connect dots and see that this experience is not unique to Christianity. It's found mm, in absolutely. Kundalini Yoga, for instance. Um, uh, mm-hmm. the, there, there's, there's other, it spans cultures and faiths. And so um, that was reassuring, because at least I know it's not like, it, it, what it told me is like, okay, they don't have, it's not like they have the only answer. Um, yeah, it's like it's copyrighted. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's not copyrighted. Right. <laughs> so, but, you know, it didn't, I still couldn't tell you what it is, but it is activating the same neural circuits mm-hmm. um, that drugs and alcohol and sex and novelty can also activate. Right. It puts you in, in this state of hypnosis, basically, um, is what I learned. And in that state, there's something I I don't know what it is. Absolutely. If I went to mm-hmm. school, I would want to know. But yeah, it's it's possible for the human brain in sober conditions to activate this this reaction that makes you super susceptible to suggestibility. Mm-hmm. That's huge. And mimic root pressure. God, it's so important to understand because when we, I think that with fundamentalism we have this backwards understanding of our experiences. We think that whatever happened is outside. Then what we feel is a confirmation to that and draws like a connection between those things. But if that thing that we're drawing to is abstract, there's nothing to push that against. So we just feel that confirmation, but really it's just kind of like our lizard brain responding to stimuli and to what it perceives to be happening on the same level that we talk about trauma. Mm -hmm. That if something happens that is perceived as a threat, our body transfers that or or, or responds to it in a way as if it was really that threat, right? Mm -hmm. But Mm -hmm. the same thing's happening when it comes to responding to these sort of stimuli or being in some sort of hypnosis state. It's not that something is for sure third party coming out and and doing something there it could be that our body is just responding to a perception that has been Mm -hmm. built up and 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 encouraged i think a a lot of anthropologists think that there's like this like a biological mechanism to encourage human community where we can like unify around an idea Mm -hmm. by just like sort of like really talking it up and like seemingly like the more we like emphasize how awesome this experience is man right like right. Pe- you the more other people the people around us respond to it and then when a lot of people are responding then it, it just it sort of creates like a, a feedback loop hmm that's interesting anyway toronto uh, was- yeah I, yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, no but just on the heels but i do think that there's a pretty in my opinion a pretty solid argument uh grounded in I guess the more evolution branch of, of sciences mm. for faith. I think that it, like you said, it helps groups cohere and right. get along and therefore survive better. Mm-hmm. Um, and so many cultures throughout, um, known, known time, uh, maybe found spirituality through plant medicines. Right. Um, never mind what other faiths they, they made up, uh, I don't know. I, I think why humans have the capacity for faith and spiritual or mystical experiences is one of my favorite mysteries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. I'm an atheist, but I'm fascinated by it. Yeah. Same here. What was interesting to me was reading Sapiens. 
Um, cause in that he, right. Cause he talked about how narratives and storytelling yeah. is kind of like how we cast those spells to each other. Mm-hmm. So the way that yeah. I look at it is each one of us has our brains that are like computing to where we have an abstract idea. It's kind of like a virtual reality within our own brains. And then for us to kind of like want to share files with each other, we tell each other stories mm-hmm. and those narratives. And then if you feel that like emotionally in a sense that becomes real to us. And anyway, like a big thing for me now is to understand that I can hold on to narratives and stories as an atheist, still be greatly inspired by them, Mm -hmm. but not Mm -hmm. have to have like a supernatural feeling. I just have to believe in the inertia of humanity that like, this is what's gotten us so far and it's going to continue to keep us going. So I need to find the good out of it and not the bad. Party on. Well Party said. On. Thank you. <laughs> um, but yeah, the Toronto blessing, that was when that happened, um, it kind of took, uh, it, it strengthened my parents' faith in many ways and made the experience of God a lot more real to them, I think. I don't want to speak for them. Um, and I should also disclaim right about now is where I feel like I would like to. My parents themselves are no longer um, involved in the church at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they would both say they're still uh, spiritual people, but mm. um, I'm so, so grateful to be able to uh, say that I have, I continue to have a really great relationship with them. I think probably in large part because their uh, faith evolved as well as mine at different mm-hmm. times mm-hmm. and in different directions. But um, yeah, I just like to disclaim that right about here because talking about the Toronto blessing and it was super crazy. Um, my parents are not involved in that anymore. Neither though do I think that they would necessarily regret being involved. I think it really truly did have a profound impact totally on their lives and yeah. and their whatever the soul is. It, it impacted them and inspired them to um, evolve in ways that I don't think they would have without the Toronto blessing for better or worse. Um, One of those ways eventually landed us in uh, Kansas city where you mentioned IHOP earlier. Yeah. IHOP. I was about to say. Uh, Yeah. Mike Bickle. IHOP. uh, So we joined Metro Christian fellowship, which is like the home church of IHOP. IHOP is like a branch. off of that. Yeah. 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 And for anyone who doesn't know, we're, we don't mean the International House of Pancakes. We mean the International House of Prayer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Get confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Um, I love how you said that. But, <laughs> yeah. Uh, my youth group actually met in the basement of one of IHOP's administrative buildings. Okay. And we go to IHOP afterwards, or I'd wait for my parents to pick me up and like and be just chilling, doing intercessory prayer at the IHOP. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, praying, in, praying in the end. Out yeah. There. And praying for the end times yeah. and praying. For all, all the things going on in the Middle East, and um, yeah, and so that would, I would say the Toronto blessing, crazy charismatic stuff, probably ended by then. Um, in Kansas City with the IHOP, it was in some ways similar, but I didn't see as much rolling around on the floor or animal noises. Sure, it was more yeah. prophetic visions and spiritual warfare. Um, there, I just remembered there being such a heavy emphasis on spiritual warfare there, yeah. um, and. Uh, yeah, and then that was when I was a teenager. Halfway through my teen years, my parents moved yet again to Colorado. Okay. Um, mm. And that's where purity culture, I would say, mm. is like was really, really uh, more heavily imprinted on me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Is so, like, early the- was Toronto Blessing, middle, early teens was spiritual warfare, late teens was purity culture, Man. sort of how they. You were just. Uh, yeah, makes sense of my upbringing. <laughs> was it Wild. fueled by being in Colorado you, near focus on the family? Do you think? I don't see how it couldn't be in yeah. some ways. Um, we were not in Colorado Springs. We were in Longmont, which is a suburb of Boulder. Boulder. Okay, uh, okay. But it, but yeah, I mean, Colorado as a whole, I think um, it, it's it's got a lot going for it, but it also is is very strong basis for uh, evangelical Christianity and the United States military. And those two things, I think, can be, you can look at them as being very related in some ways. But um, it, yeah, anyway, I don't know if that made sense. No, that's very interesting. <laughs> I, I, Definitely. I, I didn't no. know very that connection. I guess is what I'm saying. A very militant, both, both uh, ideologies. Um, and they had some crossover too. I The mission trip that I went on, our base camp was uh, next to 
to NORAD, the base camp where we were preparing for our trip. It was next to okay. NORAD, in Colorado Springs. Uh-huh. So. It always just seemed like military and Christianity stuff huh. just were Interesting. very close I never together. thought about that. Hmm. In Colorado, yeah. I don't know. Maybe I'm the only one who, who notices that. But anyways, So yeah. you were, I, I might be rewinding a little bit, but that's not a big deal. You, yeah, go Your for- parents were like pretty, they were like not half-assing their beliefs, right? Like no, they no. were pretty serious. So so you were in like, they you were, were like pray knee, laughing, buddy. You were in knee deep <laughs> in, well, I, I was thinking more about like you, they effectively like abandoned their possessions, right? To like follow oh, yes. your thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. So I kind of glossed over that part. I wasn't sure how, how, how much of my life we wanted to touch I on. I think it's so yeah, interesting. So. Like the more, <laughs> the more serious, like, so a lot yeah, of our guests, there. like the, like the, the cases that our parents weren't that serious about it and we really were but you were like homeschooled and your parents were super serious and so i'm interested in what what that was like for you and mm. what it was like for your family you know it's interesting so yeah my parents definitely were very serious into it even within that though i think i still took it more seriously than they meant for me to sure. um in large part because they joined as adults. I was raised in it as a child. I literally didn't know any different. Right. And also, I tend to be a very literal person, um, which I'm really trying to appreciate metaphor and symbolism and connect with people in more abstract ways. But my brain just works uh, off of a very, um, let your yes be a yes and your no be a no, to use sure. a Bible verse, which mm-hmm. I always thought was really ironic coming from Jesus, I think it was, because he spoke he, in so many confusing metaphors. Yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah Jesus. Absolutely. The motherfucker yeah. lied. <laughs> he was like, oh, I'll be back while you guys are still alive. Oh, psych, I'm God. I can't tell the difference between one year or a thousand years. <laughs> Give me a break. So <laughs> Jesus, I thought, was so confusing. Um, yeah. But I still do. I still think it's even more confusing yeah, now, yeah, yeah. character of Jesus. But anyway, yeah, my parents took it very seriously. My parents um, were kind of minorities within a minority is how I always end mm. up describing them because they were this weird mix of um, traditional, conservative, and yet extremely radical. Like not many people, even within their own uh, charismatic or vineyard, non-denominational communities, necessarily understood or supported um, a lot of things my parents did, whether it was the way they ran their youth group or their home group, or eventually their decision to follow what they felt was a calling from God to sell all of our possessions, including our home, most Mm. of our furniture and belongings. We kept a few sentimental items in a storage unit. Um, And basically, uh, my dad felt like God called him to surrender worldly employment in exchange for heavenly provision. Um, And what this actually meant was that we lived in campgrounds and in the homes of random people, um, sometimes friends and family that we knew, but uh, sometimes we would literally just meet people in a campground who would be like, God, put it on my heart to ask you guys to, if you wanted to come stay with me and my family in this city state. Yeah. And we, that was obviously an open door. Um, And so we house hopped a lot. Um, with people that we both knew and didn't know. Um, And technically, we were homeless, although Hmm. we never, like, slept in a homeless shelter or begged on the street. My family's kind of homeless was still within... Uh, it was like part backwoods rustic camping. Sure. <laughs> where we shower for weeks at a time. Yeah. Um, just couch crashing, basically. Wow. wow. Um, on the kindness and generosity of people who um, some would call it God. Some, probably the more secular ones in retrospect, would, would consider it just their own kindness. Um, Humanism, yeah. And because... Yeah. I'm the oldest of five kids, and we were all homeschooled, so that in some ways made it easier. We weren't switching schools, but it also made it harder. Um, I still feel like I could relate to kids who are like, oh, I had to switch schools, because even though I was homeschooled, I had to switch churches, and that's rough. Yeah, I don't yeah. really like to switch schools, but switching youth groups is rough, and is. I switched youth groups a bunch of times. And yeah. all, I definitely can relate to like the new girl feeling, always, just always mm. feeling like a new girl, and eventually, um, when I was... I, this, my parents um, sold everything and when I was 13, and it wasn't until I was about 15 that we settled down in Kansas City, and my dad got worldly employment again, and um, we sort of looked like we were settling down. And then we moved to Colorado like a year later, <laughs> So, it, and then I moved to L.A. Wow, okay. 
or Colorado, but that's getting ahead. Anyway, sure. yeah, Spoiler my alert. parents took their faith super, super seriously. Um, they really lived out whatever they felt was in their hearts, um, despite what it looked like to other people's eyes, including other Christians' eyes. Um, and um, they, that's, you know, even though it was an extremely difficult time for me, right. um, I, to this day, admire my parents for being just so stick and true to their own guns. Sure. And just, mm. you know, like there's a lot of things that, a lot of conversations that we've had um, as adults now where we've been able to like, I've been able to understand a little bit more than what they would tell me at the time, mm-hmm. um, which I think for me has helped me uh, ultimately feel a lot more connected to them, yeah. um, a little more mm-hmm. sympathetic to them, even though um, obviously I'm, I'm making very different choices as an adult than they right. made, but um, yeah, it's it's definitely a trip to look back on. <laughs> I feel like not a lot of people's parents can like offer a like functional explanation for why anything was the way it was. I mean, I guess like a lot of them still believe the same things that they did when we were growing up and we were going through all this shit. Um, but man, it would be nice to just like for my one of my parents to be like, oh yeah, let me explain why I was like <laughs> super fundamentalist or my for my mom, like why I was, you know, s- super charismatic and like, you know, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Anyway. Yeah, sort of self-awareness doesn't um, occur very often. Not in, no. Mm. Boomers, man. Mm-hmm. Boomers. <laughs> so, so Colorado, you get, you, you start getting the purity culture. Purity culture. Shit. You, yeah. Okay, so you're I'm, like covering all the <laughs> religious trauma bases. Like you've got like really weird spiritual shit. You've got rapture anxiety from IHOP. You've got spiritual <laughs> warfare, fear. You have, and then you you get launched into purity culture. On top of that, like instability and homelessness. <laughs> Jesus Christ, man! You had you covered the whole gambit. I yeah. yeah. <laughs> it feel it feels like it. Um, I certainly know other people had it far worse not that it's a trauma competition but right, like um, you know but still I, I definitely i i've had my share as much as anyone has mm-hmm. um colorado i had just turned 15 when we moved there so that's like i think i would have been a freshman had i gone to school <laughs> um that was the other thing i never knew what to answer people were like what grade are you in because i would just be not knowing I was coming off as total Hermione Granger type smarty pants, just be like, well, I'm 11th grade reading, but I'm only eighth grade math, but then I'm 10th grade this. And I yeah. was just always such a oh, mix. Yeah. So um, when I was, <laughs> I, I divide my life um, into chapters based on location, not grade. Okay. Um, so Colorado, uh, we plugged into a church right away. Um, another vineyard style connection and the I was very involved in the youth group there it was the only outlet I had to make friends um and uh not at that church but at another church somehow is where I attended this purity conference called when God writes your love story by Eric and Leslie Ludi yeah, it's um, really familiar there it's not that different from the Joshua Harris I kiss dating okay. goodbye style mm. courtship um letting God write your love story. Uh, And it talks a lot about the same things as courtship, about um, don't date, don't encourage lustful thoughts, guard your eyes, guard your thoughts, um, and trust that God has a spouse for you that he is going to reveal in his time. and He's Mm going to confirm his Mm -hmm. will through the spiritual elders that he's placed in your life, whether those elders are your biological parents, your youth pastors, I know, shudder. (laughs) Um, But uh, but uh, yeah, so it, this that teaching of how courtship and my love life was to go was just reiterated over and over and over. My dad gave me I kissed dating goodbye when I was eleven. Jesus. Um, wow. Twelve that I was I I think it was like right before I turned twelve that that book came out. Mm. Um, so eleven or twelve, my dad gave it to me, and at fifteen in Colorado, it was just reemphasized again, and so I I. 
got it hook, line and sinker. And I was, I was such a hopeless romantic and I had such a fanciful imagination. And I was like, man, God's promising that if I'm faithful to him and to my future husband, he's going to reward me with a love story even beyond what my romantic imagination can conjure wow. up. Yeah. 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 So yeah. I was like this. Okay. Shit. Okay. This is going to be pretty great. And it was hard. Like I, I struggled with crushes. Um, I but yeah. I, those crushes. <laughs> God damn it. Yeah. Man. yeah that, I no, never, that's true. I never dated though. I never held hands with a boy. I, ne- I certainly Whoa. never kissed a boy. I never got close on a slippery slope or anything like that. Cause I was, I was just super devoted and mm. I would write my future letter, my future husband letters. <sighs> Yeah, um, same. I had a I had a notebook <laughs> that I started when I was I think fourteen, and I kept writing letters to my future wife up until whenever I got married to her, and I gave it to her. That's and what I, I imagine doing. It's in my basement. I think I just haven't gotten rid of it yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can give it to yeah. your next spouse, Brady. To my uh, like. I'm gay, bitch. What about to get a gay? You're my... gay, gay atheist. Oh, I wrote yeah. these for you. Hey, <laughs> hey, Dick. I don't know why I want to call Dick. Did you write it like, dear future wife? <laughs> yeah, and I think this is a good time also to mention that I'm attractive and I'm single, listeners. So just <laughs> continue on. I'll oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, so how, how did that, uh, <laughs> I'm guessing you eventually found your, your Jesus appointed Prince Charming, <laughs> fell deeply in love. You, he swept you <laughs> off your feet. You moved to Hawaii. You watched the sunset. You wept at your wedding. Your vows were <sighs> 10 minutes long each. We had our first kiss and it was perfect in front of everyone. Yeah, you f- actually, you literally floated off of the ground when you kissed <laughs> and that lasted for like two months. No. Yeah. Go on. No. <laughs> and then you started Man, hysterically I, I laughing really for three days straight. that's what would happen. <laughs> no, instead what happened was God opened the doors for me to move to Los Angeles to pursue an acting career, which totally came out of left field because I was going to nursing school preparing to enter the mission field. What? And, uh, yeah, I, so being homeschooled, I got my GED at 16. I started community college right wow. away. I'm not smart. Uh, it's just, this is what you do when you're homeschooled. No, you're so absolutely college. right. I was a grade ahead at this college prep school. I had no fucking idea what I was doing. Anyway, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, like I, I always feel like I have to say that. Otherwise I feel like I just come off like a, like a, I don't know, smarty pants douche. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Anyways, I, anyway, um, yeah. So I been being scouted for, uh, by talent agencies pretty much throughout while I was a teenager from Kansas city and Colorado, just people trying to get me in front of the cameras. And, um, I started modeling in Denver thinking it was a door God was opening to provide money for me to join YWAM and, uh, oh do my God. Oh, man, you were about school. to, you're about to triple down on that. Religious I was trauma. so deep in it, guys. I really <laughs> was, I was so deep in it. Um, for those who don't know, YWAM is youth with a mission, probably the biggest corporate missionary organization that there is. Yeah. Yeah. McClung ended up being the senior pastor of Metro Christian Fellowship in Kansas City right. when Mike okay, Bickle, okay. IHOP, stepped out. So yeah. YWAM, IHOP, all of this, this is where I come from. It's one big circle um, jerk. We've had Corey it's Pig one big on the show charismatic who came circle from, jerk. Yeah, uh, Corey Pig has been on the show before, and he came from a YWAM background as well. And has a podcast and, about it called Failed Missionary. Failed Missionary. Oh, my gosh. So good. YWAM sounds like, sounds like a nightmare. Yeah. Dude, anyway, I, I'm so grateful bullet. that I did not end up joining. Yeah. Um, I was saving for it, though. I was planning to use my modeling money to do my DTS in Perth, Australia. Uh, it was like the DTS is like the nine month. It was oh, nine yeah. months. Oh, yeah. But yeah. And then I was thinking maybe I'll stay with YWAM or I'll join Mercy Ships, um, like Doctors Without Borders, but Christian hmm. and at sea. Um, so that was my plan. Um, and then at my modeling agency, they said that some talent manager from LA wanted to meet me. Long story short, again, I thought it was a door God was opening. So I, I moved to LA. What was supposed to just be a pilot season was never supposed to book anything or actually go anywhere, but I did. And that same year, I was seven, I turned 17 a month after I moved to LA. Oh my God. Um, I was young. Yeah. And my family, my, my mom and my siblings, um, Shout out to you guys. You guys were so patient. Uh, they stayed with me for the first couple months till I got, it looked like I was going to stay. And then I found a roommate from an acting class. They went back to Colorado and now I'm on my own in LA at 17 years old, which to me didn't seem that scary at the time because I'm used to moving around and I'm always new anyway. And it just seemed like another 
God adventure. Um, and uh, a guy from my youth group in Colorado moved out to LA like around the same time as me, which, you know, nothing is coincidence in Godland. So right, right, right. we became really, really good friends. And then one day out of the blue, uh, or so it felt to me, he announced that God had shown him that I was his future wife. Oh, how convenient. And, oh, no. Yeah. And, oh, no. <laughs> I did not have romantic feelings for this guy. Um, he was a dear friend, but the big, glorious romance that God had promised me that I was so faithful for and denied all my crushes for. Yeah. Um, and the, the reveal that it was this guy that I cared about very much but didn't feel that way about was probably, to this day, one of the biggest mind fucking betrayals i've ever gone yeah, through yeah, yeah um because yeah. i couldn't be angry with god uh but i felt so in the, in the secret corners of my heart i just felt so tricked and betrayed i remember mm -hmm. journaling um god i feel like you tricked me and feeling so ashamed that i almost scribbled it out because god doesn't mm -hmm. trick or play games with you um Dude, and that so, moment when you can i just when that moment yeah, when yeah. you write something in your journal that's like angry at god and you're like I'm fuck. I'm gonna leave that. Yes. You know, <laughs> what reminds me? We yes. mentioned You're saved. Like, Take her. that. It's in writing, buddy. Or in saved. <laughs> like we mentioned saved earlier, where she finally yells oh. to oh, God, yeah. Yeah. and then it's just kind of like, yeah, you can't take that back anymore. That's been said. Yeah. You know, that's like a that's a threshold. Well, I think more than anything, I was just afraid someone might see it. I don't know who I thought might see it, but I already knew God knew that was in my heart, so I couldn't. I, there's no point scribbling it out for God. Right, right, I just right, right. it was just this autopilot reflex of like yeah. I can't be angry with God, like like but yeah I'm gonna leave it there and who am I worried about finding it now? Like my siblings aren't around anymore. They're back in Colorado, sure. so I don't know. Like I I um Adam and it, Eve it would have taped the, a leaf on it, huh? Adam and <laughs> Adam and Eve would have taped Pretty. a leaf on it. Yes. Uh, oh, that was funny. I'm no sorry. Worries. Was that not enough? <laughs> maybe maybe a slice of meat. <laughs> Oh my God, Brady! All right, you're off this segment. <laughs> you can come Penalty back. You can box. come back on the next segment. Okay, bye, <laughs> listeners. Oh, um, yeah. So I, I didn't. I went along with it though. Um, I totally played along with it. I li straight up lied to my friend, saying I was so happy that it was him, mm. uh, and I, I went along with it for two months um he like called my dad and asked for my hand and everything and my dad gave it and here's the real clincher my dad said that he also heard from god that i was going to marry this guy oh, and the guy's man. mom said that he had heard from god uh, so there's oh. the external affirmation from my spiritual elders so clearly i'm the only one not hearing from god but i never did while well, everyone else in the toronto blessing right. was receiving visions and getting prophecies and hearing from God, I never did. I like I said, mm. I just faked it. So this was just another thing I faked. I faked a very happy betrothal, um, but I didn't fake very well because my mom could tell I was not stoked. And um, kind of, she was the one who pulled me aside and was like, "You don't have to marry him." Uh, and I thought the devil was just using her to God, give me yeah, what my flesh wanted because my mom had right. stopped going to church by that point. Mm -hmm. so, in my mind, she had kind of like, I wasn't going to church either, but I had an excuse. I was new to LA and I didn't know if I'd stay and I didn't want to plug in only to like pull out. So, yeah. uh, I couldn't, I don't know. It was, it was, um, one of the most difficult times mm. of my life, uh, wavering over whether or not to go through with this marriage, um, <sighs> and decided not to. And I still feel shaky with fear inside yeah. when I remember telling him like, wow. That I that I was calling it off That's and I wasn't so, going to marry him. It's not just disobeying God's will for my life. I was directly affecting God's will for his life. Oh, so yeah, I felt yeah. double punishment. Um, but of course, I was taught God doesn't punish; He just allows consequences if you don't obey Him. Sure. So God, you yeah, yeah. <laughs> allows consequences. Ugh. Oh, oh, that's yeah. so much worse. I'd rather it be like, yeah. I'm punishing you. Yeah, it's right? like the I'm disappointed in you. I'm going to allow yeah. this consequence. Oh my god. 
I relate yeah, with like, what you're saying about the wedding. I called, uh, I had, I was engaged to someone before I got married and, uh, ended up calling it off like because of the conviction, because somebody showed me verses in the Bible of what it says about remarriage after divorce. And oh, I was like, yeah, that was like about a whole that ass thing. Yeah. And so I remember it, that that was a big deal in my life. And, um, I remember even after calling it off, like I had nightmares of having to relive that and I'd wake mm. up thinking, Oh my God, oh. I still have to call off the wedding. I don't want to have to do this, but I have to do it mm-hmm. and I realized no it's been done already like and it was hard it was hard mm. but she ended up coming back and saying that she respected me for sticking to my guns and then also whenever I did get married my church really pressured us to to get together like to get married etc because I came from a very like family pushy church and it was kind of the same high pressure stuff that you're talking about. And one family did have the self-awareness to come back and apologize to me of how much they pressured me to be in a relationship with my ex-wife who ended up cheating on me. And I, and I kind of, I do respect that even though the people lost my respect immediately after, but there we go. It lasted for a few minutes. Ding dong. With that said, uh, with my long rant, uh, we do need to take a break. (laughs) Am I right guys? Because my long thing, anyway, we will be right back <laughs> right after this. <laughs> okay, Chuck, are you ready? Have we only have one shot? We got to make this work. Uh, wait, you didn't give just just, me just read any, your lines. Uh, I'll give you the paper. Oh, okay, okay. Psst, are you guys ready? Are you ready? Oh, All right. Uh, oh, uh, um, are you ready where, where, to, where, to where, deconstruct where with friends? What the, what the hell? Where did, where did all this come from? <laughs> Deconstructing your faith it used to be lonely you got a band? and boring as hell. Wait, wait, wait. But no one must wait. deconstruct their faith alone ever again when you um, deconstruct the friends. Um, Chuck, tell them what we mean. Um, yeah, Go. That's, that's right, Brady. Yeah. Uh, the life after has a... Uh, uh, Help, Brady. Uh, I went full on Jamunji on this one. You keep going. He's a rental. <clears throat> by the, hour. the the Life After podcast has a secret Facebook community and Slack yeah. channel for people deconstructing the, the uh, Christian fundamentalism and other oppressive religions. Uh, meet new people and and, uh, and deconstruct with, with friends. friends. <laughs> nice job, Chuck. You even got the echo. Uh, thanks. Uh, that was kind of cool, I guess. Oh god, he's touching me with his trunk. Uh, you can apply for the secret group it's on, our fa- on our Facebook by answering three entrance questions. Your membership is hidden, and the admins keep the room constructive and helpful. Now, can we get this elephant out of here? Nope, probably not, but we can. Deconstruct with friends! Welcome back to the life after we are here. Welcome with back to the Alice life after we are here with Alice Gretchen. Are we saying that correctly? You guys are. I that made me so happy. <laughs> before before we brought you on, we got on to Google and we Googled, Googled it and Gretchen pronunciations. pronunciation. And um, and we got a nice uh, Polish man going Gretchen. Yeah, he was <laughs> Gretchen. He was kind of robotic. <laughs> Yeah, right. <laughs> How did the other one say it? There was two. One was like Gretchen. Gretchen. Yeah, one was one like, was like Gretchen, and the other one was like Gretchen. Yeah, one sounded like a Bond villain. One sounded like <laughs> just a person Bond trying villain. to talk. Yeah. Anyway, speaking of rabbit trails and journeys and pots of gold and uh, mixed metaphors. Yeah, where do we leave off? We're in LA with you right now, correct? LA. We're in LA. I finally break up um, with the guy that I was supposed to marry, yeah. even though I felt like we were never really together because I was never in love with him. Right. But I was going to marry him. Um, his Can... dad was like going to plan our engagement party. It was Ew. intense. It was all moving very quick. There is this thing in Christian culture where it's like a man feels completely comfortable going up to a, a woman and saying, you will be my wife. <laughs> <laughs> like it's not that uncommon. It's I have really several not. female friends that grew up in church that had that experience where it was just like a dude just one day told them that they were going to get married and how they respond to that varies depending a lot on the person. But it's just like that shit is so weird, man. And you there was so yeah. much social pressure for you to go along with that. Yeah, um, and, and also it, this guy is not the only guy. There were two others that told me the same. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Thing. So apparently, God's plan for me was to like be polygynous. 
I don't know if that's the right term, but <laughs> or just to be polygamous. able to divorce. Yeah, <laughs> right. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, this guy was the first. I was 17. And, well, no, he wasn't even the first, but the other guy was a little batshit. So I didn't even count him. I just thought he was I thought he was doing it um, to take advantage of me. I didn't think he really meant it. Mm-hmm, but the guy mm-hmm. that I was betrothed to, I think he really meant it because I think his heart was totally sincere. I don't think to this day, like I always defend him because I, I think a lot of people think that he just had his own ulterior motives and hid behind God. I think he genuinely believed this, guys. I just yeah. do. Um, I mean, I definitely believe well, that God but... <laughs> told me who I would marry for sure. I mean, I didn't take that same approach of just telling them, but that's how I felt for like two years before. But I mean, it makes sense. We've talked about it with like, you know, Derek Webb and everything that our intuition is the voice of God to us, you know, and that's how we read it when that's how we frame it. So (laughs) yeah, if you're really attracted to someone and uh, I may say so of myself, you're very attractive, Alice, then it's like, (laughs) you know, if somebody (laughs) has that in their, in their minds and they think they're owed and and you've, and you've like crammed all of your sexual feelings way deep down into your self conscious or your subconscious. You know. And who was it, like Abraham or something? You know, some of the patriarchs, it's like, yeah, he found a hot chick and he married the bitch. Yeah, yeah, It's like yeah. how the Bible reads. Like, it's such a superficial <laughs> yeah. thing. Right. Yeah, or, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. or like, I just yeah. realized the other day that, that, that Abraham more or less pimped out Sarah when they arrived. Yeah. I did not realize that shit. Anyway, that's a total sidetrack. So... And I just wanted to point out, and like especially in charismatic circles, it's like Ooh. way more common for like that, like somebody to be like, "You should date this person," and then a bunch of people <laughs> are like, "Oh, I feel the vibes of that," and yes, you guys should date. And then with young people, they're just like, <laughs> "And you two will go face. together, and these two yeah. will go together," oh, and yeah. it's just like it always turns into a complete disaster because you can't fucking do that to people. But it's like it's the really first common. scene in Mulan, just on repeat. <laughs> right? Gosh, there's yeah. other chapters to this DVD. Yeah, Without so another number. Shutter movie moment, or because it's not a TV show, but uh, some indie theater where I live ke- was celebrating the return to the big screen of Fiddler on the Roof, oh, yeah. and just oh, the I'm trailer the alone had me doing like the Shutter, oh, where, I, yeah. where, where, they're ta- where the guy is singing his "If I Was a yeah, I don't know the song. I don't want to remember the song. I hate it. I hated that movie so much because I thought he just hated women so much, and like women were just the bane of his existence. And like, yeah, you know, he's just trying to like have the matchmaker marry off his his daughters because the poor man only had daughters. Uh, but yeah, uh, poor guy. anyway, anyway, yeah, judo Judeo Christianity heavy on the patriarchy, heavy on the male uh, authoritarian ship of the household. Um, and I didn't even bat an eyelash when he told me, basically, because, of course, God would tell me through the dude and not mm, me. Sure. <laughs> I yeah. thought it was just yeah, the beginning yeah. of me learning to submit to my husband's authority Ooh. instead of oh, my God. father's. Yeah. So that's that's just how I – that's what the framework that I was raised in taught me to – primed me to look at it that yeah. way. So, um, so yeah, I, I broke up with him the following three years. Uh, well, before I go there, let me just say that when I broke up with him – I didn't know it at the time, but I was also beginning to break up with God yeah, um, yeah. because that for me was the beginning of the end. That was when I would now use the term start to deconstruct. I still had no intention of not being a Christian at that point. I just wasn't going to be the charismatic evangelical sort anymore. Yeah. I stayed in L.A. I looked at more liberal L.A. style churches Um which I hated (laughs) and for a variety of reasons. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, I really was trying, as my friendship circle grew in LA, I had a lot of friends who were gay, uh, friends who were bi and um, friends who were Scientologists, friends who were Buddhist. And so I just found it harder and harder to believe that these wonderful people who are nothing but love to me would go to hell. And, Slowly, it just my faith just started eroding, eroding, eroding until eventually um, I I gave God a test. I broke all the like the biggest rule I think in the Bible is like do not test the Lord your God, and I tested the Lord my God and he failed. <laughs> yeah. um, surprise, and surprise. So, yeah, and so that was it. And I remember it feeling really kind of anticlimactic. Um, 
being like, oh, it's like, but it was instant. I could never go back. The instant I stopped believing, I knew somewhere in me, I could never go back to belief again. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you know, my life is still mm-hmm. left to be lived. Maybe I'll change. I don't, I've changed in ways I would have never foreseen. So I'm not going to set myself up right here, right now saying that I may not change again, but it's been 12 years since. Yeah. And since I became an atheist, not because I wanted to be an atheist and not because I didn't look at other spiritual paths either. I looked into all the different religions and all the different non-religions, um, including like, I, I think of it as like LA spirituality, spirituality, which involves like crystals and tarot cards and past life therapists. And like, it's a very woo woo sort of put it in the universe manifest sort of brand mm-hmm. of spirituality that to me just still required faith. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And to me, faith was the common denominator that they all had that got me into all the pain I'd ever known. Mm-hmm. So up until that point, of course, there's pain in the secular and as you, well. But you most always of felt my... like you were faking it, though, right? I mean, like you, you yeah, never really never experienced real what people talk about when they say, you know, they no. got they got faith or something like that. Yeah. No, no. I mean, I so I don't want to say it wasn't real to me because it was. I believed it. It was real in that sense, but I never experienced it. Mm-hmm. Um, I would mimic the experience of it because I never wanted anyone to know that there was something wrong with me, that Mm -hmm. God was leaving me out Mm -hmm. when I did all the things right. I was such a conscientious kid that I I don't know what more I could have done right. (laughs) Right. And still God didn't reward me with his touch or the manifestations of his touch. So um, and people tried to tell me, oh, it's because you're expecting to hear or feel God a certain way. You need to be open to letting him touch you or speak to you how he chooses to. Uh, that, a, a way to uh, yet again blame it on the person it's yeah. not the ideology yeah. it's not the faith it's the fact that you're a sinner and there's something wrong with you if yeah. you're not hearing it and so i am so done with that yeah. mentality yeah um again it exists outside of faith i don't mean to say this is only in faith circles but uh yeah after after i became an atheist i had a hell of a lot of fun for about two months uh-huh. it was cr- and then i came crashing down into right. what i know religious trauma syndrome. Um, At the time, I was on medication and in therapy for panic attacks and suicidal ideation and like self-destruction, like harming myself and uh, falling apart, wanted to die because life had zero meaning Mm -hmm. anymore. Um, When you're told your whole life's purpose Mm -hmm. is to live for God and God doesn't exist anymore, Mm -hmm. what the fuck is your life purpose? Right. Um, I didn't I didn't know that life just for its own sake could be purpose enough. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's and maybe and it's not sometimes to be honest, but I find ways I found that uh, I've in coming out of it where I'm at now is I feel like I'm really enjoying the freedom to choose as much as I can. I don't mm. think we have a choice about a lot of things, including how we feel or what we believe. It's not my experience that faith or not faith is a choice mm-hmm. any more than depression or happiness is a choice. If it is, no one will be depressed. Um, yeah. So I, I think for me, my journey through all that, um, it was rough for a few years uh, with the therapy, with the processing. There, I was not part of uh, – one of my triggers was communities and groups. Right. Yes, I yes. A whole online existence of Very other people common, yeah. who were in my same boat. And But even if I had known about – like even if exvangelical had been a thing back then, sure. I wouldn't have gone anywhere near it. Um, I was so leery of groups of um, – I still am to this day, to be honest. Yeah. Uh, it's one of those things that I'm taking baby steps into now. Yeah. Um, I started going to an acting. I couldn't even go to acting classes because mm. talk about mentality. They're mm-hmm. so fucking weird. Um, but I found one that I like and I've been taking. Zip I, zap I'm zooey. Of- <laughs> it gets weird. Shows it's up. Um, yeah. But like it's it's uh, I, I feel like I, there's part of me that still very much does not want to um run the risk of getting swept into group mentality mm, again. Yeah, and yeah. part of me that is knowing and understanding, okay, but I'm I'm a sapien. I belong with other sapiens. Right. And I they people not all people are safe for me, but certainly there's there's something to be said for the value of community and, yeah. and maybe maybe it's part of the reason why I've 
uh, maybe I've been alienating myself too much and Hmm. maybe I could integrate more. So it's trying to integrate and build community wisely. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, not, I feel like I'm just beginning to do that now, not so much from a place of like panic fear, but to be honest, there is still a little bit of fear, but I'm trying to big difference look at it more like wisdom and and still just try to be open to it there's a it feels scary it's really i mean that's really 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 common right and, and because you know our trauma is literally associated way. with gr- no 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 not in a minimizing way at all no i mean in a validating way if yeah, anything. yeah um like, yeah. It, we, like so much of our trauma is surrounding just things that happened while we were in a big group of people or times that you were manipulated by a big group of people. And I think that like finding, so with our show and with the, like our community online community and stuff like that, a big thing that we try to emphasize is, is that is like finding healthy means to heal your trauma without Mm. like, without like diving so deep into it that you're like lost right so Mm -hmm. it's finding a syst like a system that works for you for like a community meets these check marks of like there isn't like a, a a charismatic leader that's claiming any particular you know beliefs or trying to get you to adhere to a certain system or things like that or like uh that you know there isn't anything super unusual about the practice of the group and the way that they go about things you know i mean it's like you you can find criteria that you can follow or that sorry how do i say this you can find criteria that a group fits that is comfortable for you but it takes time to parse out what those criteria are for you particularly yeah yeah that makes sense right Mm-hmm. I like how you said that. And it wasn't hard for me too. Cause whenever I was coming out, there was like a group of like, uh, queer people that here in St. Louis, like every week have like a potluck and I went to it once and it was hard because like my son was still really young. And so like, I had like this weird thing from my old church of making sure that my son was perfectly well behaved because that was the expectation. And it was like a weird thing that my mind was still being a pain in the ass mm-hmm. for. But in that, in that environment of just being inside of a people's house and having a whole bunch of like people shoved in there, um, it was really triggering for me. It was hard. Mm-hmm. And I know that a lot of people experience it too. If they go to like an ethical society, like the mm-hmm. ethical society, of St. Louis, um, or like a Unitarian nomination it, or something. Yeah. Those are hard for people because they, they very much reflect and feel like what we, what we came from and what we need to run from. Um, but mm-hmm. I like what you said about taking those baby steps of knowing, okay, in some environments you have to tell your brain this right in some Mm -hmm. environments it's going to look like shit it's going to look like danger Mm -hmm. but it's not going to be that danger Mm -hmm. in fact i need to remind my brain that the um there's healing in some of these environments sometimes and so we have to kind of remind our 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 cognitive side hey these are the Mm -hmm. things that you need to actually be looking out for here are things that are going to be safe for us but you have to ease back into it because we're fragile little animals you know yes (laughs) yes and afraid of of um for me, I'm afraid of my own gullibility. I'm afraid mm-hmm. I was duped so many times, you know, and so I know I'm susceptible to um, believing the best about people and glossing over red flags Girl, and yes. ignoring my my uh, my instincts. Mm-hmm. And I think um, I think giving myself permission to a listen to myself, yes. acknowledge those instincts, mm-hmm. and also strengthen the muscle of being able to know okay is this instinct coming from like a fear panic triggered place or is it coming from like a yeah this just isn't for me right you know like right you know where it's a more calm it's not loaded with like the energy of of like panic and fear it's just a either just distaste or just doesn't gel or whatever it is you know it feels a little more calm and so that's kind of how i in my own mind sort of suss out what's um uh, at least not super threatening mm-hmm. in the beginning. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Baby steps. Yeah. 
baby steps, you know, because I think early on I definitely plunged into things because mm-hmm. I, uh, I, yeah, I, I don't know. But now I think I'm a lot more cautious. Mm-hmm. I got too far on the cautious end where I just didn't try anything. I avoided everyone and no one was to be trusted and all that. Um, and now I'm trying to move back into a, a, what I hope will be um, just a more truthful mm-hmm. um and curious ground, mm-hmm. um, moving forward in life, not staying isolated and stuck in one sure. place. And it, it's it's all like the whole point is that it's a work in progress, and it's just it just takes time, and like there's no timeline yeah. for it. There's no reason to really like you need to push yourself, but you don't need to like really push yourself. It's not like it's yeah. not like Christianity where there was it was like here's the ideal and here's where you are and the faster you can get from here to here the better, you know. It's mm. like yeah. here's, you know, like like just take a step when you feel comfortable doing it, right? So yeah. I wanted to ask you about um you so I I read a bunch of your of your blog entries on your website and I really liked a lot of what you had to say. So you uh talk pretty openly at this point about being an atheist, but it wasn't always the case, right? took you a while to get to a point where you were comfortable talking about that. Like how did, can you comment on that a little bit? Yes. So, um, close friends and family have known I'm an atheist for a number of years now, but I think, and I think I've, I've said this maybe in, uh, one of the blogs, um, part of the reason why I didn't use the word atheist was because, uh, it just seems so loaded. Um, it's loaded with all of these associations to the new atheist movement, which a lot of people are very offended and hurt by. And I understand that because a lot of aspects of that movement are very, um, mocking and belittling. Condescending, yeah. Condescending. Yeah. Milady. Oh God. Milady. Tips fedora. (laughs) But, uh, (laughs) but, um, I, and I think I might've said this on the Graceful Atheist podcast interview I did, but I do think that there is a time and place for that type of atheism too, though. Mm -hmm. Um, I know it spoke to me, it validated me intensely when I needed it. So I view it, I view Mm -hmm. the different types of atheism, like I view different types of anything. Um, comedy is always the one that stands out to me because comedy is also very polarizing and offensive and condescending to many people. Mm. But there's a place for such comedy. Mm. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I I definitely went through a period where I was very offended by certain types of comedy. Mm -hmm. Um, But uh, I don't know. Anyway, with atheism, I think I, when I started Dare to Doubt, which was earlier this year, I want to say I got the idea at the end of January, um, end of January of this year. I didn't quite know what it was going to be or what it was going to turn into. I knew it. I knew I would blog on it. Um, and I realized that as I was putting it together and encouraging people to live in their truth and to acknowledge what was true for them and to, um, not uh, to, to find the courage to even just ask themselves if something was true for them or not. Oh, and yeah. if it wasn't to give themselves permission to let it go, I realized that I need to, um, and this is going to sound so youth group of me, but I need to live that example myself. Um, yeah. because I, who am I to encouraging people to live in their truth if I'm not living in mine? So it was, it was partly a challenge to myself, um, that I wanted to come out as an atheist. I never denied it. If someone straight up asked me, are you an atheist? I would say yes. But to be out about it, um, felt loaded for several reasons. One, I was very reluctant to label myself as anything again, Mm -hmm. because I felt, I feel, and I still feel in this way, I feel like labels often inhibit our self permission to grow and change, or I know they do for me. Because once I brand myself as something, I feel like I'm going to fall off a pedestal of my own naming if Mm -hmm. I deviate from that. Um, so that was one reason I was, I was nervous about it. Employment, to be frank. Um, I was worried if I come out as an atheist, I won't be as bookable as an actor. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. because I won't appeal to as many masses. Um, and, uh, also, did you know it's harder to adopt a kid if you're an out atheist? Yeah. 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 I just found it doesn't surprise me, but at the same time, it's like, Oh, another atheist. I know. I, (laughs) You, you know, know a guy? guy. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Oh, man. All right. The black market is by kid. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I decided I decided to come out because I wanted to live in my own truth. Mm. 
I wanted to help encourage other atheists to live in their own truth. And also there's not a lot of women in particular or people identifying mm. as women who will be an open atheist. And I think it's in large part because there are, for some reason, I would love to analyze this data more, there don't seem to be as many female non-believers. Females seem more prone to whether it's the God gene or some some sort of neurological wiring, um, most most females tend to have more of an openness to faith than mm. s- some some males do. I don't know what that is. Please don't quote me on it, anybody. Um, it needs much more investigating. Uh, but I read that statistic, and that was part of the reason I wanted to be like, no, but I'm here. Sure. I'm here, and yeah, I know yeah, other yeah. Women who are also atheists. So why is it so scary for us to come out? Why why are women so marginalized within atheist communities as they express being? I've not gotten involved in any of the atheist communities because again I'm leery of just community. Period. Um, but I, and I don't really feel the need for it to be honest. Like I have so many close friendships in my life. I'm open to it, baby steps. But right now it's not. It's not there, um, mm. so I can't firsthand speak to what it's like to be a woman in the atheist community. But from what I've heard, it can feel very marginalizing and um, mm. misogynistic, imagine, yeah. as, as any space yeah. can. Or as um, right. any any space, especially <laughs> in the Western world, can feel particularly. Yeah. But also something that's like logic based, where the feel of sure. it is, well, don't you see it, dummy? You know, oh, like yeah, that yeah, sort yeah. of attitude. And I also think that like there there is some, some systemic issues too where like having this sort of platform hasn't always been available to women. And so there hasn't been as many opportunities for space in that. And then so you are having to fight misogyny. So I don't know if it's all like chemical wiring and you know women having spaghetti brains while men have waffle brains. Oh God. But <laughs> I wonder, you know, like mm-hmm. how all of those things kind of contribute together to kind of come for like, sure. work together to make a, a very complex ecosystem of messed upness, you know? See, and honestly, I'm much more inclined to, to agree with uh, your take on it with that take that it's less a biological thing and more of um, just another symptom of social cultural conditioning mm. where maybe, maybe women don't feel a safe uh, voicing their thoughts or they're not asked for their thoughts or beliefs. Right, right, yeah. Um, so it's, I don't know. I think there's so many ways to analyze to analyze why there are not as many out female atheists as there are male. But um, I don't know. I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm, I'm definitely out there now. I'm yeah. living in my truth. It feels great. Yeah. Um, I like to, I like to also, what I hope is um, show a softer side of atheism. Um, I don't like, I don't like debates really. Um, Yeah, we don't really either. If someone's trying to convert me, I will debate. But like, I'm offering up Okay, hard same on that one for sure. You know, if they're not being respectful, you know, like I, but, and I like debate from like um, a curious standpoint, but not, I don't, I don't. I, I would not like to be up on a stage with a Buddhist priest and debate about the existence of God. Sure, that sure, does not. Sure. That's not yeah. my jam. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think. I think um, there are. I would. Li- I've been thinking a lot lately about the type of public atheist that I that I would like to be because I know, and it's it's really the private atheist that I am. But um, finding my space in the online world has been challenging weird isn't um, it <laughs> huh it's weird isn't it it's, it's very weird it, it's a uh, i didn't know it was gonna be so weird um it's very loaded out there mm-hmm. i'm very surprised and honestly a little disappointed sometimes with how very loaded it is out there especially um you know, finding my online space and what i want to contribute to the conversation yes. uh, not just about atheism but especially about atheism deconstructing leaving faith just everything you know yeah. like like there's there's so many people saying so many important, valuable things and anger is so needed and people definitely need to let it out and people definitely should feel free to express themselves. I feel fortunate in that I've, um, I definitely still get angry, but I feel fortunate that I feel like for me, the rockiest part of my deconstruction right. is is hopefully through. Yeah, <laughs> At least yeah, I've, yeah. I've been out of it for some years now. There- and it's a, it allows me to be a little 
um, in a place of, uh, just, I'm so much more at peace with myself, which I feel allows me to tweet more peacefully. Yeah, <laughs> there you go. you're coming from a place <laughs> of confidence. There's a point where you really need to start figuring out how to let your anger go. Cause it's like, everybody's angry out of the box, right? Like angry, angry. Like I remember just like, I like the, for some reason specifically the memory comes to mind like one day I was like mowing my lawn or something and I was just like yeah what the fuck and I just like got my <laughs> my like note and like a notepad out and just started writing down all these stupid things about Christianity you know and it's like it's so it's so good to like have those moments where you feel free just like yeah. saying like this was fucking stupid but like over time the goal needs to be to like let that anger go and like just put that all that energy into something new you know and god ruined my twink years yeah i know you had great you would have been a killer twink brady you would have been a great twink <laughs> Fuck little shit you would have got you would have some weird ass stories yeah <laughs> <laughs> so alice um i really like so you you there's some commentary on your on your website from you about like what it's like to be a Christian that knows the Bible really well. So we were both homeschooled. Brady was like really into it. We've both read the whole Bible. Or, I mean, we've all, the three of us have all read the whole Bible. We know what's yes. actually in Virtual there. Virtual high five. Virtual guys. high five. Yes. Hell yeah. And there's like, <laughs> there, like even, even back when we were like, you know, growing up and reading it and really serious about it, we like really either didn't understand certain parts or like skimmed over them. And now we like know it so well, we can go back and be like, wow, this part was really fucked up. But there are so many people that are Christians, and it's usually the ones that like approach you about, you know, why you don't believe anymore or like how they're praying for you or whatever, mm -hmm. that just don't have any fucking idea what the Bible says. You know what I mean? And it drives me yes. crazy. And it, it's just... And anyway, like you, <laughs> you just had some really good things to say about that. I mean... Oh, thank you. Yeah, it's it it boggles my mind why people would brand themselves with anything that they haven't read the literature of. Yeah, yeah. Um, whether it's a political thing or, in this case, a religion, right. uh, it's it's something that I've I like. I have friends who would identify as Christian or use the language of Christianity that have barely read their Bible, yeah. and I've picked their brains, being like. It, it, they're such a mystery to me. I'm like, what? What is it with? Like, how? It's like I want to pry apart their mind and be like, <laughs> yeah. how do you? Yeah, yeah. What? Are, where? How? Why? Yeah. This word Christian means something to so many people that it does not at all mean to you. In fact, you seem equally mystified by what it means to so many other people. Right. Right. But well, isn't that just language, though? You know, like all these all these words can mean something different yeah, to anyone. For sure. But, so some of it's just semantics. But I, I feel like to align yourself with a religion. To me, and again, me being just a very literal kid, I take it so seriously. It. it sounds like it. we were all kids who took things very seriously. Yeah. And um, I still take things seriously. Absolutely. Uh, I don't know how not to. And so when people don't, when they are like, oh, it's just it's what it means to me. I'm like, okay, that's that sounds very beautiful. But I'm still so confused. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's how I genuinely feel. <laughs> well, throughout this, like, at, well, speaking with you, and you talk about how you process your beliefs and your values and how you just operate, it sounds remarkably familiar to my own internal thinking. Like, I, like I'm just listening to how you're, you process stuff, and I'm like, yeah, I get it. That's exactly how my brain works, too. That's how I process it. Like, I get it. I get it. I get it. Wait, what and, is your Enneagram? You mentioned Enneagram earlier. What I are you am, guys? I am a 4.5, um, which oh, means cool. that I have probably had a deep loss earlier in my life that has caused me to make creative things to try to fill that void. And a 0. 0.5 is that I like to have a collection of experts on a on a thing. So my 4.5 is that I've made a podcast to, you know, fulfill right, my void of right, losing right, God. Right, like right, it's, it's kind of like, right. you know, and Enneagram is one of those things where it's like not getting your fortune told. It's you know yourself that when you read descriptions you're like yes that's me now 
you know, it's not about the lining of dates, which by the way, our birthdays are in the same month. I was born February 24th, 1986. I don't know. Oh, why that's funny. Your birthday so came I'm up I'm like on three your... weeks older than you, two, two and a half, somewhere on February yeah. 6th. Yeah. February 6th and it came up on your IMDb. And I was Neither like, oh of gosh. us know if that makes you the same sign because we don't care. I'm a Pisces. <laughs> is that what you are? The fish thing? <laughs> But but the thing is, like, other ways are like, you know, here is the date you're born. Now here's your personality. And that's not the, that's not helpful. And I think, like, oh, sure, Myers-Briggs yeah. and things like that, you know, some people are critical towards them. And I think that everybody has the right to be critical. But I think that there is an important yeah. distinction to make of it's, one it's is knowing about opposite. yourself. One is, yeah, one is saying, there, here's a thing about you, therefore all the rest of this is true. Mm-hmm. And, the, the yeah. like, Enneagram and, and Myers-Briggs are saying this is what's true about you. Therefore you are this, yeah. which is way more helpful. And you get like a little bit of like insight on your personality, which is most likely a generalized going to be a, a helpful for you to understand something that you may not understand. So it's a great way to, way to learn about yourself. Anyway, right. we were talking about the Bible though. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So taking <laughs> things very seriously. I yeah. know Chuck's trying so hard to keep us on, on oh, track. It's all, it's all right. um, <laughs> so yeah, the Bi- the Bible, what about the Bible? Uh, yeah, so we were just... T- uh, okay, so the point I was trying to drive home is that, like, there... Okay, so many Christians, then this frustrates me to know and don't actually know what they believe, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, they think they... They know what they believe personally. They just don't know what the system that they are perpetuating teaches. That's a good point. Right? And there's... Yeah. And that, that just frustrates me to know in, and I feel like... It makes it so easy to be in denial about the problems with it, right? Ooh, so it's yes. like, so it's like, you know, oh well, the you, you take an average like mega church, you know, white person, right? And they're Ew. like, go, they're like, that's like forty something, and Ew. you you start talking to them about like Christianity and in sexuality, right? Ew. And it's like you can say. Like, you can say, like, the Bible says all of these insane things about sexuality, including, like, if your, you know, daughter gets raped, you have to, like, the guy that raped her has to marry him, or has to marry her, and she has to marry him, and it's like, and it's like, it says that we should stone women to death if they're not virgins on their wedding day, and Yeah, or if they didn't cry for help loudly enough while they were being raped. Right, yes, exactly, (laughs) and, like... We should stone men to death for sleeping with other men and things like that. And it's like, because you don't, you, you've been taught to emphasize this set of verses and not give a shit about this set of verses, you, mm-hmm. you end up perpetuating this incredibly destructive system, like, unknowingly. And their response would be like, oh, well, there's grace. Oh, well, Jesus died for that. Oh, that's Old Testament. It doesn't count anymore. Oh, mm-hmm. you know, sh- all of this shit. But it really doesn't work that way, you know? I mm-hmm. mean, if you really read the text, it's just uh, the excuses don't pan out, you know? Definitely. I, so I, I tend to agree with you. I think, I think you can make the Bible or any text kind of say whatever you want it to say, but I, there's so many verses emphasizing how God doesn't change. Mm-hmm. Um, and the God of the Old Testament then is therefore the same God as the New Testament. Um, and instead of demanding that we sac- make all these sacrifices, he's going to sacrifice his own son is basically mm-hmm. the big thing that changed mm-hmm. the difference between them. Um, I, yeah, I, so I'll share with you how where my mind has gone to sort of try to make sense of what is so nonsensical to me, these Christians that don't read their Bible or, or know what they're supporting. Mm-hmm. Um, I think of them as Christian inspired. <laughs> That's like okay. the label yeah, that my yeah, mind yeah. had to come up with uh-huh. to to um to file them away so it's not this looming question mark driving like clouding our conversation in my mind and i don't think this is fair by the way it's totally it's probably not seeing them how they want to be seen maybe but it's um it's the only way my mind can let go of the frustration of like but but this doesn't make sense like what you're saying though isn't actually christian because it's a like yeah 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 so so i think of it as i think there's probably i would call it a christian inspired movement happening mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, based on an people, untrue story based on an untrue story <laughs> yeah there you go yeah. um so, it took some liberties it's like pocahontas disney's pocahontas yeah. version of christianity <laughs> I don't, that exactly. wasn't accurate no no, <laughs> no no brady it wasn't it was not she's accurate. not just around the exactly. river bend <laughs> exactly. she might have been I mean, around the even, river bend <laughs> 
Well, and even the Bible, the Holy Bible that we're talking about, one could argue isn't accurate. It's highly edited. Oh, it's yeah, not yeah, yeah, yeah. There it's so like many not books even getting in. into canon. So much right? lost. No, no. So we, we're not even t- scratching that side yeah. of things. But it's like I would scratch it, and I have. And I've yeah, looked at yeah, it, yeah. and I've read <laughs> the Gnostic sure. text. So, like, I think it's – um. I I think I think what I like I said the only way that I've found to sort of make peace with this confoundingness mm-hmm. is to just accept okay there is a new spiritual movement stemming out of Christianity where they use the language of Christianity and it's inspired by Christianity I don't know why they're rolling with it because again why would you want to associate with something that is so far from what you actually believe and live yeah. but okay you're 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 appropriating it, shall we say? Sure, yes, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. That's in a, a good way, way that's it. a lot more accepting um, or liberal or whatever you want it to be. And why mm-hmm. do I have a problem with that? Probably because I was brought up in such an extreme version of it. Right, right. Well, it empowers but, it empowers the more extreme versions of it because there are numbers of people that call themselves Christians that Chuck, will, you're so. That's what it is. <laughs> it's the it's it empowers these these more. Yeah, and it's like that's our beef with liberal Christianity on this show, and why we try to steer people away from it is that like it ju- it's I mean there are a number of reasons that we have beef with with liberal Christianity, <laughs> but one of them is that it empowers the more fundamentalist systems because it's really it's really hard to say my liberal interpretation is right and your conservative interpretation is wrong. It just ends in a in a debate or a yeah. standoff, and everybody just k- keeps their power. Yeah. Can, I'm going to give a really quick example, and I'm going to speak fast because I know that I, uh, you know, whatever. But okay, You're let doing me go great, on Brady. the record. Let me go on the record. We all want to know what you have to say. Oh, thank you very yeah. much. I appreciate that, Chuck. Let me go on the record of saying I don't proactively try to discourage people from liberal Christianity. <laughs> okay, all right, maybe not next thing. <laughs> but the, the theme is that my son and I we were playing this video game that we have, and it was a science trick. Like it was a science lesson that I tricked on him because it was a game, <laughs> sucker. But the theme of it was about so natural stupid. selection. And mm-hmm. what it had to do with was with butterflies and that some of the butterflies are known to be poisonous. And so over the generations, the butterflies that were mm-hmm. adapting to look like the poisonous butterfly um, didn't get eaten as much mm-hmm. because animals were trained not to eat that mm-hmm. one. And so mm-hmm. it benefited from the toxicity Oof. of that. And Oof. so knowing that we're not cho- we we're not butterflies we're choosing how our 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 beliefs evolve if we're Mm -hmm. going to be valuing beliefs over whatever and so that's how i kind of look at it now is you need to be self-aware right of like what you look like with your belief system and Mm. um when there's nothing to verify it with when it's unverifiable admit that and treat Mm -hmm. other people knowing that Mm -hmm. you can't verify what you're saying. Um, And so that needs to change your tone a little bit because I have a lot of people who are like maybe even progressive Christians that are very, very, very educated. Like you had mentioned people who don't Mm -hmm. know it's in the Bible, but the people that I deal with are mostly people who know it's in the Bible, but have a different way of looking at it that Mm -hmm. is going to reinforce what they're saying. And they're going to use these deep deal. Oh, but if you look into this part in the Latin and the Greek and and it's, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. that's just like another version of we're all going to speak Latin. Uh-huh. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. but you all are going to yeah. not know what we're talking about. You're going to have to rely on us to, 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 to interpret explain. it for you. Yeah. And, and even then what you had mentioned before, there's still an element of, of faith and I have yet to see any supernatural thing at all. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. if I want to go by statistics, because I'm a robotic person, if I want to go by statistics and make the best decisions possible, why don't I go with a thing that actually has a track record mm-hmm. and that is using Mm. logic and science and you know uh, mm-hmm. and, and empathy and uh what i've learned through professional therapy etc instead of just then closing my eyes and saying okay well i'm just going to read a script well you mm-hmm. can't do that with your eyes closed unless it's braille but you get the point <laughs> like yeah anyway <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah no i'm i'm with you yeah so uh you talked a little bit about uh, well okay sorry i should i should qualify in one in one of your blogs on your website which everybody should go uh Look at dare to doubt.org, right? Dot org? Yes, cool. dot org. Very We're cool. dot org. Too. Doubt. 
Uh, you talked a little bit. I really, I really liked this, and I'd never really thought about it before. But it's Ooh. totally true for me. It was that you, like, your knowledge of the Bible helped you cope with your religious trauma through your deconstruction. <laughs> yes, about sex. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. For yes. Sure. Yes. No, I think the title of that blog was um, Jesus Never Said Don't Have Sex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because, yeah, no, it was crazy to be like after I after I I couldn't sustain my beliefs anymore and found myself an atheist. One thing that still tripped me up um, was the good old Christian guilt that I carried around sex. Mm -hmm. And it would like I would have sex with my boyfriend at the time. And when he would leave, I would sometimes be so overcome, like just balled up in a quarter, mm. like shaking, being like, but what if I'm going to hell? Mm. You know, like, what if they're right? And it wasn't so much that I thought having sex necessarily would send me to hell. It was, I think more what it was is sex, especially in my teen years, was the part that was so um, emphasized mm -hmm. it, uh, upon in that belief system yes, was yes. just don't have sex, don't have sex, don't think about sex, don't dress sexy, don't look at a man sexy, don't even look at a man, like, right. or a woman, you know, wh whatever, right. whatever your flavor is, don't look there, don't go there. And um, I think that's why all of that conditioning, uh, I think all of that conditioning definitely led, makes sense to me why sex was probably my biggest trigger post-Christianity, because mm. it was the thing that was emphasize the most not to do. And so when I did it, um, and enjoyed doing it, uh, I would feel sometimes just scared after all of that fear and condemnation and guilt would come flooding back. And I would read my Bible to calm myself down, but reading it from a non-believer's perspective, um, and looking at it just to calm down the the wiring of the believer, the believer wiring that was still in my brain. Cause just because we don't believe anymore, it doesn't mean that that wiring, unfortunately goes, <laughs> it doesn't right. go away. It takes, so, it takes a long time to go it takes away. A long time. I think it's, I think sometimes, I think some of that I'm just going to live the rest of my life with. But I'm always good, finding I new wiring. It. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah. But like we can, we can recognize it now. And so I mm -hmm. recognized where that Christian wiring was getting triggered about sex and I could read the Bible to assuage that wiring by being mm. like, look, even if you were a Christian, a follower of Christ who focused on the works and words of Jesus, mm. Jesus actually had fuck all to say about premarital sex. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it was like, it just wasn't there. He talked about divorce. Yeah. Um, and I think I wrote about that in the blog too. Like in the context of divorce, he was talking about, um, you know, cut off your hand if it causes you to lust after someone and gouge at yeah, your eyes, yeah, like yeah. that whole that whole bit. Um, and then he he talked a little bit about, about about divorce. But I figured, if Jesus really or God, if it was really really such a big deal for them that consenting consensual adults unmarried to each other not be sexually intimate they would have made it so crystal clear like the butchery instructions in the bible for how god wants lambs and birds to be butchered are so explicit like where oh, to go what point. to do yeah. how to spill the blood how to make the bird smell to go waft up to the heavens to so the aroma pleases god like god is very specific and explicit when he wants to be he was not explicit or specific about premarital sex hmm. and so reading that gave me peace because I was like, oh man, if it was really a big deal, like apparently all these other things were, he would have been explicit about it and he wasn't. And like I said in that blog and getting into the, the Latin and Greek origins of things, sure, um, sure, yeah. <laughs> a lot of the translations of fornication, mm -hmm. which today colloquially usually mean like sex outside of marriage right. or what yeah, yeah. Term. conveniently <laughs> yeah um it actually kind of it, it seems to have had its its roots in i think the greek word porneia mm -hmm. which meant harlotry i had to look up all these words okay so then yeah. harlotry what does harlotry mean whoredom okay whoredom prostitution okay prostitution uh cheating on your spouse cheating on your so like all these terms but not one of them said consensual sexual intercourse right right yeah there were all these other terms. So yeah. I, I don't know, like I, I was, that's, that's how, uh, that's how I calmed myself down when I would feel that's anxious cool. about having sex post Christianity. Mm. It was right. being like, you know what, you know what, you poor little Christian wired brain, even if it is true, 
even if the rest of the faith is true, this part's not, so you're good. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, it's like this. It's fucked up, but it worked. <laughs> it's taking advantage of the fact that the Bible is so easy to manipulate, right? Like you yes. can sort of, you can sort of, when you're really struggling in that in-between period, I feel like you can sort of like take, if you, if you know how to like, man, if you know how to get really into exegesis, like you can, as in like studying, you know, specific verses, you can yeah. really like dig into the Greek, dig into the other, other passages in the Bible, dig into this word or that, and just be like, oh, it doesn't mean what I thought it meant. And then just move on with your life. You know what I mean? It's just kind of a funny, interesting way to do that. Now, I mean, it's like, you don't want to do it to the point where you get sucked back in where it's like where it's like feeding the thing that's drawing you back into it but you can do it in kind of a I, I mean I totally did it with hell a lot for me when I was deconstructing mm -hmm. it was just like well you know the bible's view on hell is n extremely complicated to say the least yeah. and the old testament <laughs> doesn't even mention it and neither does the gospel of john so like maybe I can relax about the idea <laughs> of hell, you know my version of this would probably be kind of like whenever I was coming out and was like I was a liberal christian for a few months and I was like a, a, a gay christian is how I identified and so reading some of the backgrounds things of like okay what does it really mean to be homosexual in the bible when did that term actually come up what it was actually said kind of going through those things i think was a helpful thing for me um but like you're saying it for some people it may be a step that they they pitch their tent on and dwell on for a while but for the rest of us it was kind of like a oh this is icy and you just kind of slide across you're like okay see you later bye bye right yeah mm -hmm. chuck what do so you do to calm down after sex <laughs> <laughs> um i orgasm <laughs> after sex no i mean like i don't know that's how i calm down <laughs> okay <laughs> sure, I, know. I don't need to calm down after sex man i feel there is no point in my life where i'm more calm than after sex mm, i drink a diet coke <laughs> Good. Just a pain tight, tight 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 um mm. i watch bojack no um i don't know that's a good show voice cuddle so, alice <laughs> <laughs> it is a good post-coital show. Mm -hmm. Oh, God. It actually is. I'm sure I've done that. It's such yeah. a good show. Yeah, I'm sure I've watched Bojack after sex many times. <laughs> Alice, <laughs> I'm so sorry that we're the way we are. Can you... Don't be. No, this is so much it. fun. Can you... <laughs> Uh, tell us about Dare to Doubt. Tell yes, us about please. Dare to Doubt .org. I just want to say I I love like before you start I I love certain aspects of it. You have uh, d like deconstruction guides based on different faiths, which I think yes. is fucking awesome. It was brilliant. Um and Thanks. quizzes the quizzes the, the quiz quizzes is so qu the quiz is great. <laughs> oh man, I was so stoked about this website. So I love what you're doing. Tell us about it. Thank you so much. Um, that quiz took me so long to build. <laughs> I'm so glad it's appreciated. Yeah, um, oh, I would imagine, so, yeah. So Dare to Doubt came from um, one of the last lines of a book that I wrote that I'm actually in the middle of publishing. Okay, hello. Uh, it doesn't have a title yet. I'll let you know what it does. Cool. But um, it's, it's, I wrote, I wrote the, the phrase came out in writing. I don't even know if it'll make the final cut, but I wrote dare to doubt. And I was like, oh, that sounds like a catchy hashtag. I should see, you know, what, what is this? And it wasn't taken. The <sighs> website wasn't taken. The Instagram handle wasn't taken. Wow. The Twitter wasn't taken. Get, I was get, like, get, get, get it. dare to doubt. Like, how is this not? Yeah. Because this is like, this is what I'm, this is what I'm saying. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I got all the things, all the handles, all the domains, um, and like I said, I wasn't quite sure what it was going to turn into. I've always known that I wanted to somehow work in the space of helping other people who are in the throes of leaving uh, their belief system. And I basically created the site that I ne needed to find when yes. I was fresh yes. out. So there's so many sites that exist like that now. But back 12 years ago, I really don't think there was. And like I said earlier, even if there was, I probably would have been too scarred and leery of them to, mm. to see what they would have to offer in terms of um, support, mental health, community, all of that. So, uh, But there's a lot of people that can't imagine deconstructing without the support of others who are in the process. And I'm so happy that there are so many resources out there now mm. for people. And so I always imagined that I'd have maybe some sort of um, nonprofit foundation that would give grants to people to get therapy. Mm -hmm. um, because I was in therapy for three years after mm -hmm. I lost my faith. We'd never heard, me and my therapist had never heard of religious trauma syndrome. 
Um, and he was still able to help me with what I now see were exactly a lot of the symptoms. Yes. Uh, and therapy is really expensive. And I've been very privileged um, to have a career that's afforded me the luxury of being able to go to therapy um, with or without insurance at the time. And so uh, I felt like that was such a gift that I gave myself therapy that I wanted other people to have access to it. And I still do. And eventually, with Dare to Doubt, I have future plans for it. And one of that is one of them is hopefully getting some sort of grant scholarship thing um, to fund counseling for people who are low income and can't afford it. Um, that's down the road. In the meantime, I really wanted to be able to at least point out to people where they could find a secular therapist. I don't know if you guys have experienced this, but uh, there's a lot of Christian therapists out there because yeah. it's very much like just, yeah. Um, oh yeah, we yeah we have a whole episode about we have a whole episode about the problem with Christian therapists. Therapy. Anyway, yeah, okay. yeah. Sure. Well, and even non-Christian therapists, like they won't say they're a Christian therapist on their website, but right. many people who care about shepherding a flock in Christian terms or nurturing, you know the psyche of others in secular terms, like, I think, I think, um, there's, there are fortunately a lot of secular therapists out there, but there are also a lot of faith based therapists who are privately faith based. It's not even necessarily part of their practice. It's mm -hmm. just, and I've come across them by accident where all of a sudden, like, I can tell that what I'm saying is triggering something in them and that they're still a believer because they're telling their, yeah. the, the human side of them shows and how could it not? We're all just human. Right, so, right. Um, nothing against them. I'm, I'm glad that they're there for the people who, who they can serve and, and help. But for me, that was not mm -hmm. obviously like, mm -hmm. helpful. Um, it invalidated anything they had to say because I felt like in my, my mind goes no longer trustworthy. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Believes in something that is completely made up and bullshit and harmed me and hurt me and is hurting thousands of others to this day. And unfortunately, my mind just writes that off. And I know it's an unfair judgment call, but it's also a survival call yes. that I need to protect my trauma yep. when the reason I'm going to therapy in the first place has Preach. a lot to do with yeah. religious trauma. <laughs> so, yep. it's, uh, so I wanted, there's the Secular Therapy Project run by... Um, Freedom uh, why from am Religion. I, not Freedom from Religion. They do more law, legal stuff, but um, Recovering from Religion. That's it. I get the names uh, mixed up. Sorry, everybody. Um, um, no, no, no. I know I do the same thing. There, there, there's a lot of free <laughs> and free from religion type of things. So, so basically, my goal was to um, start a resource site where people from, as you said, multiple belief systems could come and at least have a starting point of where to go. And I wanted to make it... Uh, I call it millennial friendly because not to knock on these other wonderful resource directories, but I get overloaded by them and I, uh -huh. I not like super tech savvy, but I'm, uh, it, if I'm struggling with them, mm -hmm. I think a lot of other people will be struggling with yeah. them. Yeah, They're laid out the best. text mm -hmm. windows, take up the whole screen. <laughs> like there's like not many images. You guys have a lot of images as I recall. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like it, one thing going first. Yeah, like it's a. I wanted to make it visually appealing and yeah. easy because I didn't want people to feel I feel the way I feel, which is completely overloaded when I go to most research sites. Like uh, I'm scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Right. I click here. I don't yeah. know if it's the right page. So right. I'm sure people could say the same thing about dare to doubt dot org. Um, uh, I built it myself using Wix. Shout out to Wix for making this Ooh, way easier. It's, I think um, that's what we use too. I think it's super intuitive, but again, yeah. it's I, I love Wix. Um, but yeah, it's and there's like there's every time I go on the site, I see a a, a section where I'm like, ooh, ah, I need to change the layout of that. So I'm not saying it's perfect by any means, but for me, it, it met my own standards of, and I tested it with a bunch of people rigorously being like, where do you feel confused? Was there anything that didn't make sense? Did mm. a page link you to something where it shouldn't have? Um, I had a lot of testing through very generous friends and family um, who played around with it before I released it publicly. But yeah, I, there's, uh, I'm working on the Jehovah's Witness page now, working on a Catholicism page. Cool. Um, yeah. There's so many belief systems out there. Right now, I think I only have seven. Mm -hmm. um, and I went according to uh, the ones that that have a big population and or um, 
extremist needs. Like sure. the, the Amish population is not big, but it's such it's such an extreme right. isolated religious subculture that I feel and I feel like it's really hard. That was the hardest page for me to build so far because there are so few resources specifically mm-hmm. to help Amish people. And the ones that there are, get this guys, they're Christian. So oh, there's a lot yeah. of to help the Amish to leave the Amish church to join the mainstream evangelical Christian mm, church. So right. it's been really hard for me. Like I, one of the things that I did when I built the quiz uh, is I wanted to make, I wanted to allow people who were just dipping a toe into doubt or into questioning still feel mm. like resources for them. I didn't want it to be so strongly atheist because I, like I said, for three years, uh, it was three years between my break with evangelical Christianity and atheism. Mm -hmm. And during that time, if I had found a website like Dare to Doubt, and it made me feel stupid for even believing in any version of God, I wouldn't have felt safe there. That's a great point. That's a great point. I don't have an atheist agenda. I really don't. I think that faith is very real for some people, and I would never want to take that away from them. My only goal is to help the people for whom it is not real or not all parts of it are real. Mm -hmm. And them that hey you're not alone first of all there's so many people that mm-hmm. are it will be exactly where you are and here's some some people who know how to help you through that if you're looking for a counselor if you're just looking to talk to someone if you're looking for <laughs> an in-person support yeah. group in state if you're looking for books of other people who have also left islam or scientology or mormonism whatever it is um here they are you know, like dab a toe or leap off the wagon wherever you're at. And that's why in the quiz I, I, I ask, I think one of the questions is, um, you know, do you prefer secular only resources or do you prefer faith friendly? I use mm-hmm. the term faith friendly because I didn't want to say faith based, but like maybe maybe they're just not sure. I but like they're, that a lot. Sure. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Can, can I use so that phrase? I like that. Faith please, friendly. Please, I'm thinking yeah. about I'm that. thinking about myself deconstructing and like googling things and like not really. It's in 2015, you know, 2014 coming up with anything that like seemed to work. Like I remember finding a blog by a pastor or by some Christian that had like lived atheist for two years and then decided to go back. You know, and I'm just like, mm. well, hey, this is not what I'm <laughs> like. After. This is not what I'm about. Mm-hmm. I don't want to go back, man. You know, so mm. I'm really glad that you're doing this, and and uh, and I hope that it becomes. Let's all just Google. Everybody Google it <laughs> a, a lot. Everybody Google it five times today, right now. Oh. Get out your phones. Hey. What are you doing, man? <laughs> Google it five times. No, just kidding. Um, but but we want it to work. We want it to be successful. And then you won't Thank be blind you so anymore. Much. And then yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah. Wash spit, your spit on your phone. <laughs> and Google it five times and then wash your eyes and then you can see. Really quick, one of the resources that I saw was that, you know, that 14-year-old atheist that just clobbers all the middle-aged Christian men in debates? I saw like 15 seconds of one of his debates and he said something about, um, it really put in perspective how fucked up hell is and how fucked up mm. God is for creating hell. And yeah. I saw 15 seconds and yeah, I was like, yeah. God damn it, I'm not going to be able to unthink that. Yeah, yeah, And that yeah. was towards the end. <laughs> Hell yeah. Hell yeah. God damn it, the 14-year-old. He Jesus. did it. So, <laughs> Alice, thanks so much for being on the show. This has been a good old time. And, oh, uh, thanks so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, you are a delight. Um, can, Do you have any, any Hollywood stories before we go? Just any, like... <laughs> Brady, okay, can I just... Like, I want to qualify this. Brady is like... Is like knows everything about a lot of TV shows. So <laughs> I'm probably on the spectrum and this is my thing. Yeah, that, yeah, it's his, like it's a spectrum y thing. Yeah. Okay. And, they, and you can list B list actors for days. <laughs> okay, okay. You probably know way more than I do. I'm still playing homeschool catch up. Like <laughs> Brady, why don't you um, tell us a story? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh so okay. I'll tell a story. So one of the times, the biggest time that I ever got starstruck, mm-hmm. um, which happens occasionally, uh, but I did not see this one coming. I'm at Trader Joe's with my brother. We're grocery shopping and I'm getting ringed up at the checkout. And then I look, I like look to my left and there's just this giant bicep, like right at my oh. eye level. I was Dwayne, like, Dwayne the Rock was, Johnson. I'm just guessing. Me. I looked up. And I just seen the movie Munich, and it was Eric Bana, yes. and I 
And I had like just seen Munich and I think he's really hot. And yeah. so yeah, I, was just like, oh. I was just so unprepared. I, I did some weird sort of like gasp and looked away immediately, of course, and like felt just super awkward. But uh, the best part, though, was on my little grocery route. The next place my brother and I went was Whole Foods for the spices that Trader Joe's doesn't have. Mm-hmm. And as I'm walking there. Here's Eric Bana and his wife waving at me nice. in the car. Left, uh, like, oh, you're in the same route. <laughs> and I was even more dumb and starstruck than I was at the Trader Joe's. I was like, hmm. Probably did some really stupid <laughs> thumbs up. Um, but yeah, that. And, and then, I don't know, like other Hollywood moments. I feel like there's so many fun. LA is so fun to live in. There's so many weird Hollywood moments. Yeah. Um, I didn't get to go this year, but every summer before the Emmys, uh, my boyfriend and I get to go to this super exclusive Emmys party Ooh. called The Night Before. Okay. And it's really, really, it's like walking into all of your favorite TV shows. You're like, oh, there's Sansa Stark. Right. Oh, there's Lady Mary. Oh, right. there's so so. Like, there's, it's just like walking into Netflix and Hulu <laughs> and Amazon Prime all together. <laughs> and it's an HBO. Like, it's just That's like great. all of it's it's and you just feel like a little kid and like we both get imposter syndrome we're like what are we doing i don't even know how uh-huh. what are we, we're just gonna go over here and eat all cookies and mac and cheese um, <laughs> me too, and it's great but Very uh cool. No, and that's all due to my my uh, boyfriend. I am his plus one because I haven't worked on anything in a while. But okay. he's on a show called Station Nineteen okay. on uh, ABC, which is a spinoff of Grey's Anatomy. Okay, cool. um, uh, and so he's he's working and killing it, and I'm really proud of him. Uh, his name's Gray Damon. Google him. Ooh. I'm in love. Oh, Gray Damon. Uh, <laughs> Gray Damon. Yes. So he gets Man, invited that's a to sexy a lot of sexy Hollywood name parties. for sure. It is, and can you believe it's actually his really his real name? Great that was one of the first things no, I asked. No, I thought him. for sure that was. It wasn't. sounds like well, it, it's kind of derivative of of Robin from Batman because there's Dick Grayson, and then there's <laughs> another another because oh, yes. there's more than one Robin, and yeah, another yeah. Robin is Dick Damian. Grayson. So oh, it, okay, yeah, it's like Gray a very Damon. like yeah. Anyway, he's basically oh. Robin. Basically. He, would, he would love that reference because he loves comics. He's like obsessed nice. with comics and and monsters. And you should see our house right now for Halloween. It's ridiculous. He <laughs> went so <laughs> the Halloween decor. Um, he's making me play homeschool catch up with all the horror movies I never saw. So this month, October, there's <laughs> there's so many horror movies out there. Um, but yeah, he gets invited to a lot of fun parties. I get to go with him, and we cool. get to together share these imposter syndrome moments where we're like, "Where are we right now? What life are we living right now? This is so funny." That's so cool. Oh my god, that would be like <laughs> my afterlife. That would be Very my good. afterlife. Yeah, that's your afterlife. Well, to like go to it for like twenty minutes and be like, "Hey guys, I just need to go take go home, take a nap." <laughs> Speaking of go home and taking a nap, uh, we probably need to let you go and to you know let our listeners live the rest of their lives instead of listening to this goddamn podcast all the time. <laughs> um, on that note, uh, since you've had enough of this podcast, remember to uh, subscribe, rate, and review. I said that really slowly because I had to remember what the words were. <laughs> and uh, we do have an online community yeah, com- that you can join. Explain it's if not, you're not speeding anything up. If the, if the idea of community is not too intimidating for you, uh, we do have a private online baby community steps. where you can... Yeah, baby steps, exactly. <laughs> uh, maybe we can talk Alice into joining our community. No, um, uh, and uh, yeah, it, process your deconstruction, process your religious trauma. Uh, and we do have a Patreon if you want to support our efforts, um, because uh, we everything costs money. Because <laughs> <laughs> um, capitalism. True. We have a little saying on this show, uh, and and that is, if, if you, you don't know go it, to church, church Sunday, Sunday is, is just a second Saturday. Saturday. See you next Woo! time. Thank you for listening. <laughs> oh. Out the garden, back to back, stab at God King and ask for his pardon. My mind trying to break out the margin.
legends writing reflections on loose leaf listen hard my jargon is darwin inciting infections of unbelief like what in the hell is your spiritual walk but meditating on ted talks elevating events that are non-stop circulating your views in a closed crop cutting verses up like a chop shop with copies and signs like a bookshop pasted in like bibles on backdrops feeling bad for shit on your laptop it's a bad prop for holding beliefs in a sad book